Good morning. Good morning. I'm early. I know some of you are going to be complaining. I saw that space. It was supposed to be at 10 o'clock and I missed it. <laughs> uh, it's toggled to be recorded and it's showing on my screen that it's being recorded. So no worries. All right. So this morning, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how to win in trades and had like an interactive engagement, if, if you will. And I want to kind of like utilize the non-farm payroll event yesterday as a foundation. One of the things that you're going to hear me say a lot in the videos, the boring parts that most people don't like to hear, is that you have to understand yourself know yourself and or as it's said many ways it's know thyself and unfortunately that's an an endeavor that most of us don't want to do but that's a very critical part of finding consistency it's very hard for young men to encounter this and they resist it, it they want to hold the opportunity to blame someone else or something else as the outward interference to them succeeding, not them just simply not doing what's re required or expected. And there's no shortcuts and I don't, you know, I don't sugarcoat it at all. And unfortunately that turns off a lot of people because they want it right now, real, real quick and short to the point. And they discover you know, chasing other approaches or shorter methods that promise you know, profitability. They can't do it. They might have flash in a pan one hit wonders here and there, but that's not consistency. And my aim as a mentor is to teach you how to find your consistency, not mimic mine or try to keep up with other people on social media, but you're trying to find your own lane and stay in it. So the way you do that is understanding and determining very painfully for most people what your personal weaknesses are. And that's an ugly area in everyone's life that we want to try to pretend doesn't exist. Because every one of us have a weakness. I mean, every single one of us has a frailty, something that brings a, a reason for ruin. And I mentioned in, uh, I don't know if it was two spaces ago, where I covered, like, for young men, if their personal relationships are always plagued with you know, drama and such, you, your trading's going to be very bad because you're, you're not being responsible in your relationship. And you're going to bring those same character flaws into a method of making money that requires discipline. You have to be like a machine. Like you have to be so objective about what it is you're doing and understanding where you will mess up. What makes it or what invites recklessness in you? And as a young man, you know, I didn't want to identify on any of those things initially when I had many reasons to, to have that, you know, failed marriage, you know, troubled upbringing, parents that didn't want you know, have anything to do with me. And I used all those things as a chip on my shoulder. And I wanted to have an instant gratification in the marketplace to replace that pain. And it doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, a lot of the sugar-coated shit that you see in this industry kind of caters to that, hey, buy my course, buy my shit, you know, I'll teach you how to trade in two months or three months and you'll be able to you know, make a lot of money and be part of the 1% crowd. And you find that that's not true because they themselves haven't even mastered themselves, the teachers, the educators, but they put this mask on and hide it. I don't ever wear a mask like that. I literally come out here and every time I talk to you, I'm talking from real world experience, embarrassments failures, things I've done, blown accounts. I, I, I don't ever hide any of that stuff because you all have to endure those types of things and figure out what it is that's going to cause you ruin. What is going to derail you? And before you can ever find winning consistency in your trades, you have to identify those character flaws. Many of you might be using alcohol. Many of you might be doing drugs, recreational or whatever you want to call it that's going to have an impediment in your ability to be consistent because you're changing the state of your focus, your lucidness. You're, you're not, you're not going to be at optimal levels. If you're 
doing things like that. And if you do drink excessively, you should not be in front of your computers. You shouldn't be doing anything like that. And you shouldn't be inviting. Let me say it clear because I don't think I said it clear enough. You should not be inviting substance abuse into your trading. And I have students that have wrestled with that. And they tried to ignore it and they hid it from me when they were telling me they were having problems with finding consistency and saying, I, I can see it after the fact, but it frustrates me. I can't do it then. And come to find out they have been wrestling with alcoholism. And you can't ignore it. Like that's a big elephant in the room. And maybe that doesn't fit you or your, your, your problem. And all of us have a problem. All of us have a, you know, a kink in our armor that, it may not be a big deal to anyone on the outside, but for us that have to deal with it, it's like a, a rock in your shoe. You, know, you, you can't run the fastest. You can't stand on, on good footing because it hurts. It's painful. And it's a distraction from whatever you're doing. So if that's an endeavor that you're fearful of, you need to get over that. Find out what it is that is a problem for you. It may be codependency. You, you may need to be with someone for, you know, companionship. And if you don't have it, it makes you lonely. It makes you feel anxious. And it's going to do what? It's going to cause you to do things in the marketplace to replace that. Replacing those negative experiences, that, that fearful stuff. And unfortunately, there's not enough said about this in the trading space because Again, like I said many times before, it, it forces the viewer or reader, if it's a book, to take a personal assessment on themselves. And they're not going to like what they find. When you take personal inventory and you have to do an evaluation on yourself, where am I a problem? Where do I keep making problems for myself? Where do I invite drama? Where do I cause recklessness in decision making? Where am I impulsive? You know, that type of thing uh, for the ladies. And I'm not trying to just beat up on the guys here. Uh, I know my wife is an impulsive buyer. Like if I give her a credit card and she goes out to the store with a list of things, I say, okay, go get this and don't get anything else. Okay. Well, you know what that means. <laughs> I'm not getting everything on the list because she's seen something else that she wants to get. And it's better for us to have that. And then 20 other things. Oh, I saw this thing. Look at this. This was 40% off. Yeah, I could have saved the other 60% if you didn't buy that. Okay. <laughs> That's a better deal. That's the better savings. Okay. But women generally tend to be impulsive as a spender. And that might be a problem, not for many, but it may be a problem for female traders that become impulsive about doing something beyond what they what they took out of the marketplace and what do i mean by that i have women that i've trained and a few of them uh grazi shout out to you uh, she's in our private mentorship and i hate saying that i wish i could have just paused myself there because when i do this it seems i got a tweet the other day you're teasing us about your private mentorship and then you say nobody can join but i'm trying to wind that down i don't do videos for them and i'm actually doing all my teachings publicly now. So they're in this group with you learning. So, but Grazi, she's, uh, she's in our forum and she's just a dynamo. Like I'm, I'm very proud of her. And what I'm about to say is not directed to her. And to be quite honest with you, I wouldn't even know if it was a case for her or not. I just know that she does very well and she makes it public in our forum. She, she walks the walk and no bragging, very, very consistent. And just, I'm just very, very proud as a mentor and she's doing it with real money. So there you go. <laughs> and all the other students love her too. So she's an Aussie, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, shout out to the, uh, the blokes down there that, that uh, you got one from your homeland that's uh, killing it in my mentorship and she's a lady, but I have other ladies in my mentorship that get upset that they find a trade, they get something out of it, they profit. And then they beat themselves up by getting out too early because they second guessed it. 
and they become impulsive about going right back in one more time and then being scared of the normal little retracement that may be just simply return to a small little fair value gap on a lower time frame that they're not even aware of because they're regretting getting out early. And this might be something that some of you men are actually in, encountering too and finding yourself being impulsive. Like, I want to get that too. This was enough. And it doesn't make a difference that you, you bailed out. You know, if you, you have to grow into understanding how to hold on to positions and you're not going to do it right from the first trade. No one learns how to hold a trade to full target by being able to do it the first time. Like it, it doesn't, it, that's like knowing it already, right? But unfortunately, our brains as human beings, we like to convince ourselves that, you know, we can do it in a shorter span of time. We can do it faster than someone else. And that's the cup of tea right now. Everybody wants to learn ICT stuff quicker, shorter to the point. And then I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. You're going to have to go right back through all this stuff I've told you to do. And that's where your consistency is going to be found and derived from. But if you're finding yourself being impulsive and trying to go back in to get a little bit more of the move that you didn't hold on for, that's showing you a character flaw. You're being impulsive. You're not being content with enough. Now, for those who have been following me for a long time, when you hear me or read many times in my tweets, I'll say be content with enough. I'm reminding you that if you take something that's better than a loss and you engage, you have experience now. And that impulsiveness that caused you to get out of the trade early because of either fear or anxiety or just you just can't handle it. Or you've had recently a string of bad trade ideas that didn't pan out. You know, your demo account just in drawdown. You want to build it back up a little bit. You want to just have a win. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing. It's actually one of the better things to do is as soon as you feel like you're feeling anxious after a losing streak and you feel that tendency, I got to close it. I feel nervous. Close it and then watch the rest of it. And then log it like you took the whole trade and then remind yourself that my idea panned out and I had to leave the position because I am growing in my trust. Now, notice that I said those words and not, I can't believe I bailed on this trade again. I'm so stupid. This is so dumb of me. I'm never going to get this. I'm so frustrated. You see the difference? And that's why I don't like to see people doing that in their tweets to me because if they screw up how you handle your screw up your mistake is going to set the path for you in your development and your consistency because if you're impulsive and then you get a bad result something that was not what you were hoping for and it was an adverse effect of the decision making that you had that's going to create the or invite the opportunity for you to give yourself negative confirmations. You're going to give yourself reasons to solidify and immortalize that as a terrible experience. It was painful. It was embarrassing. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. Versus, okay, this is what I did. This is why I did it. And this was the aim of why I was doing it. And it's not a bad thing. Now, if you do do something impulsively and you had a stop loss and then you change the stop loss and start moving it around like a neophyte and opening it up more. You ever see me do that in my trade examples? No, I'm only taking the, tra uh, the trade stop loss and narrowing the risk as the trade moves in my favor. I'm, my, at, my position is reducing the risk. I'm not opening myself up to more risk unless I'm pyramiding and then I'm adjusting the stop relative to that new pyramid entry because of the new equity increase or not equity increase, but the, the amount of leverage being used. But I'm actively managing that stop. But in this example, if you were to take a trade and you move the stop loss to a larger risk because you, you are afraid that you're going to get stopped out, that is something that you need to tell yourself if you get stopped out with a larger stop loss being hit. You need to go into your journal and say, I made the mistake of not following the rules about opening my stop loss up. And this was a reminder of why the rules are to be followed. Something like that is not 
kicking you in the gut and driving the air out of your lungs and, and leaving you, you know, demoralized. You're being responsible. You're holding yourself accountable in your journal. You're not sharing this online. You're not saying, hey, ICT, this is what I did. Blah, blah. You're not reporting to me. Those types of things go in your journal. You're winning things and you're losing things. Those things are recorded for your benefit. That book, that trading book that you're you're building with your journal, that's the best trading book you're ever going to read. Because it's built on real ex experience and your unique perspective on the markets through your eyes, your personality brought into it, your unique experience. And it's unique to all of us. And that's the wonderful thing that I find so fascinating as a mentor that I have so many diverse backgrounds and cultures and folks from all around the world that are doing it. And they all do it just a little bit different. And that makes it uniquely theirs. And I love that. So you got to know yourself. And it's a, it's a scary endeavor. And if you've been avoiding it, you need to just roll your sleeves up and say, okay, on a weekend, just evaluate what it is that you spend your time thinking about. Do you worry about making money, not making money? You know, are you going to get it? Are you obsessively thinking about you know, the worrisome idea of failing at this? Instead of doing that, you need to put yourself in a mindset where you're studying and looking at old things that you recorded in your journal. As soon as you feel like a negative wave is coming over top of you, you feel like something like doubt, concern that you're never going to get this, go back and look at old price moves that you have in your journal. That's the benefit of having a journal and where you got it right. That's such an encouragement because it's not like reading someone else's book or watching my video or watching my examples around taking the trade. I know a lot of you like to live vicariously through me and my examples, but that only lasts for the video. When you have done something and you've either tape read, when you study price action without pushing a button demo or, or even a live account, and you're just studying price action or taking a demo and you log that experience in your journal and you record it in your own words that this panned out exactly like I was expecting. It's so encouraging to see these types of things coming forward in my development. You want to be very positive in your journal. All your journal entries need to be positive. You want to be able to feel like you can't wait to go back and read them again. They're personal love letters to yourself. They're encouraging to yourself. No one's going to encourage you like you want them to do. Even me. I'm not there when you push a button and when you do the funded account challenges or you get a big withdrawal and you got money coming in your hands for real. You know, I can like your post. I can retweet it. But that that stops moments after that. And you might see other people come in and be a flurry of other people liking it and saying, hey, way to go. I'll be with you soon. That's encouraging. But that only lasts for so long. Unlike a trading journal that tracks your development where you have real occurrences, where you yourself have done the work, you saw the setup coming and it panned out. When you have hundreds or more of those examples, and it doesn't take long to get them, but you have to do the work of logging it, recording it, studying it, and then seeing that you did it right that many times in the past. And then when you do it wrong, how infrequent that is and how that becomes even less infrequent doing it wrong over time. That's the, the advantage of doing these things consistently and following a process. So having that mindset going in that one trade idea is not your entire career and it won't break you and how you won't look at that as a way of inviting ruin to yourself. So knowing yourself, removing those weaknesses, or at least trying to keep them from influencing your trading decisions, that's important. Knowing the general market dynamics, that's also obviously you know, a, a key factor in winning in trades. And what I mean by that, you know, general market dynamics, market structure. I've, I've taught, I've, I've, I got a student that I literally just tossed out of my private group because he's literally teaching my private mentorship and teaching the 2022 model like it's his own, <laughs> whatever. But he he's online saying that uh, I've never really done work with market structure. I have taught more about market structure than anybody has. And see, it's not just simply knowing higher high, higher low. That that's not it. You need to know the dynamics from the higher time frame down the lower time frame and then the lower time frame back up to the higher time frame and how all that fits together. 
Market structure is one component. That's it. But when you understand it, all it needs to be done is reduced down to what I showed you in the model on 2022. That's the only element of market structure that you need to focus on. Everything else that everybody makes these courses and videos about, okay, you have higher highs, higher lows, higher high, higher lows, and then you're going to wait for that shift. Okay, you can draw that out on a line chart and show all these perfect examples after the fact, but you're not showing examples of it right now, real time, and, and doing a trade. That's what I have an issue with, and that's why I don't like people trying to teach my stuff because you can do it in hindsight and sound smart, but you can't do it going forward, which means you don't know what you're doing. So you can't teach that. That's how you that's how you discern who can teach. Hear that? Got a bullet point list. I see he's been knocking them off. He's been really focused. I'm I got a bullet point list here. <laughs> I got some shit talking at the end of this video. Don't worry. The other part is seasonality. Seasonal tendencies, the the effects of when the market is more likely to produce large range moves on the daily chart. And there's a lot of volatility as an index trader. You want to know when there are earning seasons. And you also want to be aware that during the summer months. Now, this hasn't really been true in the last two months. I'm, I'm sorry, the last two years, rather. The, typically, the summer months, and when I say that, it's like July. Some of June's good. But July and August, they can tend to be really just cruddy, real cruddy type of market conditions where you don't really want to be pushing it too hard. And it's better really to just take those those months off. And that doesn't mean you can't find trades. And obviously, you've seen I can do that too. But when I teach, okay, the detractors out there love to try to take one thing that I say and twist it up and try to make an argument out of it. They'll say, ICT says that he doesn't trade on Mondays. And here's my example of trading Mondays. Okay, I go out and trade Mondays. I'm just telling you what I like personally. Now, you can go out there and trade you know, every single day of the week. I've given you tools and you know, rules to follow doing that. But I like to have a lot of things in my favor before I go out there and just try to engage. Because my character flaw and my weakness is I want and aim for perfection. And you see in my entries, I'm in there on those high candles going short. And I'm getting out on those low candles when I'm covering the short. And I'm buying on the low candles and I'm selling at the high candles. You can't deny that. And it's matching everything that I teach. The logic is there. So if the shit didn't work, I couldn't, I couldn't produce that in live market conditions. Period. Got to wet my whistle here. So understanding when there's the likelihood of having big moves, like for instance in spring. Is a tendency for the market to draft lower in equities. Okay, so stock indexes or indices rather, uh, they have a tendency to draw lower and be bearish going into the summer lows and then going into a low in the fall time. Somewhere between, it can, I've seen it in, in years of my career where it, it starts a move in August, the last week of August, but generally it's like between mid September. And the first or second week of November, you're going to find a seasonal low there. And all you got to do is look for what I taught you in the core content. If you simply just use that model, look for a, a index divergence, SMT divergence between the uh, NASDAQ, this S&P, and the Dow. I don't trade the Dow. Okay, I don't care about the Dow for trading purposes, but I use it for an analysis like dollar. I don't trade the dollar. But I've always used it as a barometer for Forex payers. So it's going to be a diametrically opposed opinion held in dollar versus other currencies. Well, when you're comparing the three averages, S&P, NASDAQ, and Dow, and you're looking for a high to form in the spring, you want to see a divergence. One of those indices is going to fail to make a higher high. That's it. You have now witnessed the quarterly shift. Now, everything after that, start looking for market structure shifts bearishly on all time frames and look for the pattern that I taught you in the 2022 mentorship. And folks, I just fucking gave you an ATM that pays out every motherfucking year and it gives you the bias going all the way into the summer. That's it. That's the that's the key. That's the fucking unicorn you're looking for. Well, how about in the fall? You're looking for the opposite because seasonal tendency wise, you're looking for a low to form. So one of those indices are going to fail to make a lower low. Once that occurs, 
what happens. That failed lower low in one of those averages, that's simple Dow theory, once that shift occurs and they go breaking their short-term highs, you're now in a buy model. What does that mean? You're just looking for longs, and you keep milking the longs with the largest leverage. And you can take shorts, and you've seen me do that. But the bigger moves, the longer protracted candles on the daily and four-hour charts are going to be to the upside after that occurs in the lows in the fall. So between, like, like I said, think like the second week of September to the second week of November. That's your like, little sweet spot. And what you're looking at is you're studying. Because I know you're like, can you back and tell me what you just said there again? I ain't looking at questions, but I'm sure it's by your, what you're thinking. What does it look like? Where am I looking? What time frame? You're looking at a daily chart. You're looking for the highs compared between the NASDAQ, the S&P, and the Dow. Make sure I said that right. Those three averages, Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ. In the springtime, okay, April, March, I'm sorry, uh, April, May time period. In that time period, you're going to be looking for, as the market's going to be going up, it will be. It'll go up. And on a daily chart, one of those averages, and I don't give a flying fuck which one it is. I don't care which one it is. I don't. It's not a point of me knowing which one's going to fail to make a higher high. I'm just looking for that to occur. Once that happens, once that occurs, and then you start looking at the one hour and four hour chart to look for a shift in market structure, just like I taught in that 2022 mentorship. Once that occurs, you have watched the seasonal high form in the spring, and it's all downhill going into the summer months. Baby, if you don't know what that means, <laughs> let me tell you something. Go back to your fucking charts as many years as you fucking want. And to see how that is such a beautiful roller coaster into fucking profitability every motherfucking year. And you got clowns out there doing mentorships and, and signal services, and they're trying to buy all during that shit. And they're getting wrecked. They're getting destroyed, blowing out and having to reset their simulator accounts. That's how the markets work, folks. And in the fall, on a daily chart, you're comparing the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the S&P. One of those averages are going to fail to make a lower low. All you're doing is simply waiting for that. You're simply waiting for that to occur. And once it does, go into your four-hour chart or one-hour chart and start looking for that shift in market structure bullishly. Once that occurs, you just watch the low form in the fall and just start looking for your best trades going long. You can if you're if you have not been trading at least for two years consistently, don't fade what I just gave you. Trade only in those directions. And you're going to get the biggest fucking moves you've ever had in your trades. And you'll be able to trust that they're going to move a lot more than just five trade Larry in fucking Texas that wants to get five ticks and thinks it's a big deal because he's got 24 contracts on it. No. Mm -mm. You want big fucking runs, big price runs. And I have students that are going in the Robin's Cup. I just gave you a beautiful blueprint to, to work within. Think about that. These are market dynamics that, you know, I'll have people come in. Oh, everybody knows that. Okay, show me your fucking trades. Show me your executions going into next year. Do it. Because I'm going to be doing it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to be fucking doing it. Live accounts. Oh, yes. I'm going to be breaking fucking hearts. Motherfuckers are going to have their heads fucking smashed. Yep, your results are shit. I'm going to prove it. So we've talked about market structure. And it, the only importance really is, is knowing what I just gave you. That right there, that element of seasonality and how those shifts quarterly occur. One in the springtime for bearishness and in the fall when it's bullish. And how, what does it look like? The S&T divergence or Dow divergence, okay, where one of the averages diverge. And then you're looking at that shift in the market structure on a four hour and one hour chart. Once that occurs, once that fucking occurs, that is it. It's on lock. It's done. Then it's going to start grinding higher. You don't think it happened? Look at your chart. Why do you think I've been buying? Why well, I've been talking about it's reaching for relative equal highs. It's going up to an imbalance. This is Sibby. It's filling. That's why. That's why it's, it's, it's following that model. Those videos I produced in 2016. Well, no, technically that would have been 2017. Yeah, because it's closer to the August end of 2017 when the first mentorship group ended. 
and that core content was produced during their class. So yeah, it would have been, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's June. I don't know. I don't recall. It's, it, I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> it's in there, but it's all, it's on YouTube now, but where I'm teaching how to, uh, find these, you know, like, like mega traits, you know, Larry Williams coined it, a phrase called, um, you know, mega traits, where do you find these big extrapolated price moves? And I was like, you know, I want to know where they form. Cause in his teachings and such, he would show this and that, and you know, I was part of this and I was part of that. And it didn't make any sense as to what was the real foundation of when, when did they occur? So I had to take a step back and I said, okay, I'm going to go through all these fucking charts and run through with Supercharts, which is a program I used when I was a younger man, and TradeStation. And I ran all these filters through to find where there was a huge impulse for the markets to be sustained one direction for months. And when it was bullish going up for months. Now, maybe there were, you know, traders out there doing this, but nobody ever told me about it. Nobody said, only do this because that's kind of boring. And nobody wants to write a book like that. They got to put 50 fucking indicators on there and different fucking harmonic names on shit because that makes it you know scientific. And if it's scientific, for fuck's sake, that means your in-laws are going to be impressed, right? So the only thing you need to know about market structure is those two things I just gave you right there. Sorry, WWA guys. You don't do that. Yeah, I went there. So the next thing you need to know is that narrative and bias. Okay, narrative and bias. They kind of go hand in hand because if you either determine your bias, looking at the charts from experience, you'll right away know what the narrative is. Or you go in looking for the narrative and then you'll arrive at your bias. So I know that probably just confused you because a lot of you are struggling with bias. And what's the difference between narrative and bias? Well, let's uh, let's go back to what I mentioned earlier about non-farm payroll. Let's assume that you watch my tweets, okay, and you're not a douchebag that's simply trying to take everything out of context. I said, you're going to have non-farm payroll and people are about to get wrecked. I said, note the relative equal high, I'm sorry, note the relative equal lows on the five minute chart on ES. Okay, so where did I take your attention to first? Below the market. So right away, your mindset should be, and this is how you go into 2023 with me. When I'm, when I'm talking to you live, okay, I'm not going to tell you, this is where you buy, this is where you put your stop loss, this is where you put your target. I'm not doing to do that. OK, I'm going to show you how you can stop wrestling with knowing where the market's going to go, because I've already taught you how to trade. I've already taught you what the patterns look like. You can get in there multiple times. It's easy to do that part. Once you know where it's likely to go and you all know this, you know this. And many of you even say this all the time on Twitter or you'll do it in your own video comments and uh, videos. I say I, I, I can see the entry pattern if I could just know beforehand, because the few times that you mentioned what you thought was going to happen. I got in there. I took the trade. It was easy to trust it because you said where you thought it was going to go. I'm going to condition all of you to not need me in 2023. Excuse me just for a second. <clears throat> My goal is for you to be independent in 2023. You will not need to watch ICT. You will not need to know what I think or my opinion. But narrative Narrative is understanding how they're going to deliver it. Who? The market maker, the algorithm, if they're going to be a manual intervention, which I believe non-farm payroll yesterday was. That was an absolute shit show. Like that was, that was a beautiful run lower, but that's what you are trying to avoid. You don't want to be in that if you're trying to go long and you, you get caught in that in the wrong side. You know, you try to do the, bracket the market here's a buy stop here's a sell stop and then you know there it is sometimes you can get whipsawed and it'll tag you both both directions and that's the part about non-farm payroll that prevents me from wanting to trade it because i don't have anything in my repertoire to know when they will do that one-sidedness like almost like a cpi like you watch me get wrecked with my opinion on cpi when i publicly thought this is what i would like to see happen but i can't push a button 
but this is what I'm I'm subscribing to. And then just right on up, it just shot straight up. Well, yesterday I told you where I felt the market was going to go to. It was going to draw down first. And it's going to reach towards what direction? The sell side. Okay. So that's that's your bias. The bias is it's going to go down. But you can't take any entry yet because non-farm payroll is highly volatile. So you got to let that market hit, run, and then see what's left in its wake. Where did it leave opportunities to come back and either run for stops or go back and reprice to where it airs an inefficiency? And I showed you that in the review yesterday. Okay. I sent a, a tweet out and said, what do you see on the hourly chart? Okay. I wanted you to take a look at your hourly chart and see what you saw. And obviously you can see the weekly, weekly opening, that gap, and also there was a volume and balance from the daily chart, extend that through, and it went down to the buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency discount low. So all of that was mentioned in the little review that I did on Twitter. So go back and watch that. It's a real short little two-minute video. But I mentioned that in a second tweet, I said, here's the buy side, here's the sell side. Both are likely to be swept. Now, if I co-signed first that sell side's my interest, that's my bias. I'm looking for a move to go lower. And it's going to go, in my mind, the largest move is going to be where? Down. It's going to seek the sell side. Why? Look what it's done all week. It just kept pressing higher, 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 up into an imbalance on the daily chart. Once it's done that, then it was a shift in market structure. You saw me sell short in the middle of the week and get the biggest portion of the move there with the $40,000 uh, example from beginning to end. I didn't have some off-screen shit, okay, over-leveraging without a stop loss as my example. I walked the whole fucking thing with no partial. So you saw the, the big move of the week. You saw me point where I thought that the non-farm payroll would aim for, but I also mentioned that both of those liquidity pools would be swept. So it created that sell-side imbalance, sell-side, I'm sorry, sell-side imbalance, buy-side inefficiency, or SIBI, big one-sidedness move lower. OK, then once the market had that report in its hands and it came down to a discount low relative to that imbalance I showed on the hourly chart. Then you watch and see if there's a shift in market structure, as I outlined in that short little review on Twitter. Then that imbalance, I grade that. OK, I get a full measurement of that and I'm bracketing it off. Where 20 to 25 percent, 50 percent, 75 to 80 percent, and all the way up to a complete repricing of that full move down. That's grading a price swing. It's not used simply in, just in imbalances like that. I use it also when I'm doing price runs that are not really run, running back up into a SIBI or running down into a BISI, buy side imbalance, sell side efficiency. And I know some of this is going to go right over your fucking head. And I know. But this is why you got to keep showing up every day. There's no ads here. I'm not getting paid to do this. I do this because I love it. I absolutely want to see you fucking crush it. And I know you can. You don't know you can yet. But I know if you keep showing up, you're going to learn how to do this shit. And you're going to be a fucking menace. You're going to be making fucking money. <laughs> and you're going to know everything what you're supposed to be doing and what not to do. And these discussions is what gets you there. Not the... Give me real quick, you know, bullet point videos. Learn ICT in five minutes. No. So once I grade those runs, either it's a price swing that I'm trading back up into, or it's just a trend. I'll I'll grade those price swings where I think it's going to go. How do I do that? I have to know where it's likely to reach for. So it takes us back to the draw on liquidity, and that is where narrative comes in play. So if I told you early in the morning that both sides of that condition of sell side and buy side would be swept, okay, you're going to hear my stomach because I'm fasting. But the idea of that first run down, nobody, nobody would have expected to see it come all the way back up and take out those relative equal highs. But you got a tweet from me saying that they're going to take both sides of those. But I told you my opinion where it's going to go first, the sell side. So once it ran down to where a logical level of order flow should come in at a deep discount on that hourly buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency being you know, repriced to, and then returning to the weekly open gap where we take that and we extend that through the week, 
So we had that one time pass through on the hourly chart where there's a green candle going up through that gap that opened up on the week. And then I said, okay, the way a market is balanced, okay, the way it becomes balanced is where if there's a gap, which is a real liquidity void, there's no trading at all, no printing by any candle wick or body. That is a liquidity void. There is no liquidity there. And folks, if you're doing videos and such and you're trying to teach my shit, I'm going to correct you here too. When there's an imbalance, okay, the market's not going back up there because there's liquidity. There is no liquidity there. There's none. So stop saying there's, there's liquidity up here. There's no fucking liquidity. The algorithm is repricing up there to engineer and invite liquidity into the marketplace because buyers will chase that. So you're being schooled today. But I grade the price swing by knowing where it's likely to go. So the first premium array that I'm interested in was going right back up to the closure of that SIBI. If it goes beyond that, will be the next thing. The relative equal highs I gave you in a, in a tweet where buy side liquidity was residing. So I had to be at Bayview, John Hopkins, with my oldest son for a procedure and I couldn't manage the trade or, or worry with it. So I just moved the stop loss up thinking, okay, it's either gonna run or it's gonna stop me out. Either one I'm fine with. And it just happened to come back and stop me out before I left the house to go meet him at Bayview. So when I know what I'm looking for and when you're gonna know where the next draw on liquidity is, that's why you have to spend more time knowing that stuff because entry patterns are easy. When every time I do a trade and I'm showing you examples of it, that's not cherry picked. That's me simply doing what I do. And you see that I know what I'm doing is right out of the notes and the teachings I give you. Every single one of my pyramid entries are an individual entry opportunity that you could have taken too. You don't need the initial entries that I'm doing. I'm just showing you everything that I see just to, by contrast, showing you that nobody else out there knows smart money concepts like I do. They can't do it. They cannot do it. And these are just low threshold shit. This is little stuff. 2023, I'm going to fucking blow your fucking socks off. But you start with this easy stuff. Knowing where the market's likely to go. Knowing that wherever the market is right now, or where it recently came from, from a low, if it's bullish, and you think it's going to go up 100 handles on S&P, then you... Take a fib and you extend it from the low it just recently made that you don't have to necessarily be in a long from. Or if you're lucky enough to know what you're looking for and you were in front of the charts as it happened and you bought that low, then you take your fib and you extend it up and you look for 25, 50, 75, and terminus. Terminus is the draw on liquidity where it goes to. Inception of the move is the, the low in this case. So you're looking for these areas where what's going to form? Fair value gaps order blocks, stop runs. They're going to occur at the 25, the 50, and 50 is going to consolidate because it's equilibrium. Look at what I showed you last night and think about what I taught in month one content of the core content where I talk about the four stages of how markets deliver price. The algorithm does four major things. When does it consolidate ICT? I just went through answering questions on my form. I'm not going to give you those answers here, but I'm giving you clues in knowing how to know where consolidations occur. Consolidations in intraday price action will occur around equilibrium. What's equilibrium? The 50% of that SIBI. It doesn't have to go up there and completely close in that one big drop. It doesn't have to do that. That's where Chris and Lori's group and I differ. They like to see all that stuff. I know what I'm looking for. I know when it ain't going to fill. I know when it's only going to go in there in a little bit, and that's an institutional order flow entry drill. I prove it because that's why I do my pyramid entries in. You don't, you don't get that anywhere else, okay? I'm not trying to kick sand in his face or anything, but I'm just reminding folks who, who, who's who and who you're listening to. It's just confidence in authorship. It's not arrogance. It sounds like it, but it's, it's not. But having that graded price run, it allows you to plan. It allows you to expect and anticipate new entry patterns. And you may not have the equity or the experience to go in and pyramid. Like if I go and I buy six contracts, 
the next wave of me entering is going to be three. And the next one would be one. Or if I go in with eight, I'll go in with eight with the first entry. And when it moves in my favor a little bit, then I'll go in with four contracts, half of the initial one. And then the next wave will be two. And then if I get another piece on, it'll be one. So I'm building in those positions. I was doing that on Twitter years ago with a demo account. Made, made it public and I literally ran up every single trade I took on a 15 second, one minute chart and a five minute chart. I was trading both sides of the directions and I was trading four and a half, sometimes 5% on the trades. Every single pyramid entry, I was using 5% max every single time I was doing it. And that's how I took the 5,000 and the 100,000 counts over to one, seven, several million dollars. I did that very thing over and over and over and over again. And as the equity increases in the demo account, you get more equity used. And that's all that was. And I am absolutely fucking ready to do that same thing in Robbins if Vinny E. Minnie proves he's in the fucking Robbins cup and shows his account number because I'm going to roast your fucking ass, bitch. So uh, the last thing, obviously, is market making principles. So market making principles are simply like time of day. You know, when is there an intraday influence? When do things that normally occur like market protraction, like Judas swings? Let's go back to uh, understanding the market structure and the shifts quarterly. Okay. If you are looking for a way to systematically reduce everything down to a nuts and bolts, this is how I do things. This is how I follow this process. I'm not going to do anything outside of these. These rule-based ideas, this is what you are trying to do. You want to do this with your trading plan. Between April, May, down into June, uh, you really want to be focusing on going short stock indices. The bigger moves, the cleaner moves are going to be on the sell side. Going long in the fall, going into the, they call it the Santa Claus rally, the Christmas rally. The market tends to create a little bit of a flurry run up higher going into the close of December. Now, with all the things going on in the world today, that's probably an invitation for it to not pan out this year. And if it does, it, don't let it be discouraged because I want you to go back through as many years as you got data to go back and look at it and you'll see it's there. It's there. It repeats. It repeats. It repeats. OK, so doesn't it make sense for you to be focusing on one side of the marketplace where there is the tendency for it to move in greater magnitude? one direction and lean only in that direction for your bias and narrative ideas for taking trades. Right away, you have filtered 80% of the bullshit that most traders fall victim to. You're not going to push it hard in the summertime because it's the doldrums. Now, there's opportunities to do that, but you're not going to be pushing your high, you know, highest leverage. You don't want to do that because there's a likelihood of it becoming choppy and messy. So time of day, you want to be focusing on if you're, say you're in the sell model, in the spring highs that go down to the summer doldrum lows, leading into the fall months low that starts to rally up into the close of the year. During the spring fall time period, I shouldn't say it like that, in the spring declining or sell model where it's likely to go lower on the daily chart and continuously drop lower. If you look at time of day, you can start studying and see that the London Open between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning Eastern Standard Time, you will have a 70% likelihood of seeing the high of the day form. What would it look like? It will look just like that fucking model I gave for free on YouTube. You're going to wait for some, pie, some buy side liquidity to be taken. Then there's a shift in market structure. Wait for the fair value gap to form. Sell short in the fair value gap. Hold it. Minimum. Hold it minimum to New York Open. And then see if New York gives you a continuation where you can go in and maybe pyramid. That's a goal for you to do. Not go out there and start doing it right now. It's just something you grow into. That's where you, you have to have a model right now you work on. But what, what is your end objective? What are you really trying to do as a trader? I want to sell short the highs in the London session or buy long the lows in the London session and hold for the daily range. That's day trading. If you're doing anything less than holding for the daily range, you are intraday scalping. 
That's it. Now you can break that down into session swing trading where you're swinging the entire New York session or the London session and getting out before five o'clock in the morning, Eastern time. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's your model, if that's what you want to do and you don't want to do anything else because time of day and schedule school business, you know, your family life, you just don't want to be in front of the charts. A lot of times you can make a career just by doing session only. Two o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the morning. There's your three hours. That's it. You're done. Or work the 8.30 to 11 o'clock morning session in equities and be done. Don't trade the afternoon. Or trade 1.30 to 4 as your PM session. That, if that's what you want to be doing and that's the time that fits your, your window of opportunity, then there it is. The question is going to be, what can I do, ICT, if I can't do any of them? I don't know personally. Like I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't fuck with Asia. It, it's very far and few between opportunities that form in Asia that I like. It's just, I just don't like it. Doesn't mean you can't find an opportunity there. I just don't have, I don't have the confidence as a mentor to say you should do that. Okay. Uh, you want to be in the highest order flow volume that's coming into the marketplace, which is London and New York session. And then the afternoon session too in New York. So those three time periods are kind of like your three you know, the three best times of when you want to be trading and why you should be doing it. So if you're using the time of day idea coupled with that cell model in the spring months going down in the summer months in stock indices, the ranges will be gravitating going lower. Now, not every single candle in the daily chart is going to be a down close. And that's another thing that neophytes do. They come in here and they think every candle is going to be a down close. But I thought it was, you know, the bearish bias was going to, you have to have other things, folks. And market profiles. Now, before I get any further with this one, <laughs> I am not talking about market profile. You know, where they do the little volume histogram, you know, on its side axis, and they look for, you know, point of control and all that stuff. That to me, no offense, corpse, but that's bullshit stuff to me. Like, I, I don't think there's any reason for anybody to do that stuff. But if you're making money with it, God bless you. I'm not here to detract or, or say anybody that's making money with it can't make money with it going forward. I'm just saying I don't personally subscribe to that. And I already know what your volume profile shit's going to say to you before you see it. So, market profiles. I have weekly profiles that I use and I use daily profiles. So what was that? I'm looking at the tendency for the market to do certain types of delivery. Uh, it'll make the high of the day in London and then go in consolidation the rest of the day in, in, in the New York session. Or there'll be a classic sell day where it'll run up, create the high of the day in London and then sell off all day long and go close somewhere close to the low of the day. Or a classic buy day where it creates the low of the day in London and then rallies all throughout the day and then closes near the high of, the, of that, particular, you know, that particular day. There's seek and destroy where it's a day that looks like a really good trading opportunity and all of a sudden it hands you your ass. It starts chopping back and forth. As soon as you, as soon as you even think it's a seek and destroy day, you stop trading, turn the charts off, walk away. I have blown accounts in bonds. I have blown accounts in s and and I've blown accounts in Forex, getting caught in seek and destroy days, pushing it, thinking I'm, I'm going to be able to come out of what I was doing and making it worse. So one of the best things you can do is in all of your studying, really put focus on days where you see it going higher, high, lower, low, higher, high, lower, low, higher, high, lower, low. And then all of a sudden, later in the day, it takes off and just blows out one other range. And that's seek and destroy. Like nobody's allowed to be making money in that day. And that, that's just, that's hard. It, it's demoralizing when you fall victim to it. And I have done it. I've done it. And unfortunately, there are times where I don't know when it's going to creep in. But here's how you know when it's likely to. It's going to be right before a big like FOMC day. It's going to be before a rate announcement type thing. Um, some kind of high impact news driver where the market participants are going to get cleaned out. 
And why would that happen? Think about why that would take place. Why would you expect it to happen? Because traders are going to do what? They're going to take a position before the report. Or whenever that big volatility news driver is going to you know, hit the marketplace and create these big CPI runs or like we saw in non-farm payroll yesterday, where it was one-sidedness and it was a big 60-handle move drop right, just like that in one minute. There are people out there that want to participate in that and they subscribe to their opinion and they want to get in the day before. Well, I admire, I admire their, you know, their courage. <laughs> it's rewarded with pain. Because this is exactly why that seek and destroy profile will manifest itself because that report is anticipating or in the minds of traders with that report, they're all anticipating a big move and everybody has an opinion. A lot of people are going to have a bullish opinion. A lot of people are going to have a bearish opinion. So for good measure, the algorithm does what? It does takes the initial short-term little intraday high out brings people in on breakouts going long, and then it goes down and takes out a short-term low, knocking out their stop loss that went long and tripping in new traders going short with a breakout strategy. Then it goes back up to that short-term high it just formed and cleans that out. So now those that went short from up there and were lucky, now they're out of the marketplace. And it keeps doing that same thing all day long. Every high is taken out, every low is taken out. That's seeking story. Nobody gets to participate in that move. And as soon as you recognize that happen or that happening in the, in the marketplace, maybe you forgot about the economic calendar. Maybe you didn't pay attention to what's likely to occur tomorrow. That is when Seek and Destroy is likely to occur. Or it can happen intraday before the FOMC, which is why I tell my students, don't trade FOMC. Because you're likely to get caught up into a Seek and Destroy day before the 2 o'clock rate announcement comes out. And then there it goes one direction and you wait for it. Because FOMC is always a two-stage event. There's the initial move that's usually fake, and the real move is the opposite direction. So these are conversations that are just too fucking good for a book, <laughs> okay? They're just too good for a book, and I know these people that like to take my shit and rebrand it and all. They're, they're going to take this stuff, and they're going to include it in a little Amazon real quick books and shit, and they're not going to credit me, but you've heard me here talk about it, and it's in my mentorship stuff too. But market profiles are little templates that I have, in my own personal study, identified what the general characteristics look like and how that weekly profile should look. When is the weekly low likely to form? When is the weekly high likely to form? What is the overall characteristic of that weekly range going to look like if we were looking at it over, like, say, a 15-minute chart or an hourly chart? What would that perspective look like if we turn it into a line chart? And I spent a lot of time as a younger man trying to come up with ways like that. And what inspired me was uh, Larry Williams had a idea that was a uh, trading day of the month. Okay. And what he had was this little – every month he had the S&P broken down and, and the bond market broken down. And, man, I'm telling you what, like there were times where it was like spot on. It was like a seasonal tendency. For those individual two, um, two markets that were showing you like critical key turning days, and if it was like you know, the fifth trading day of the month, it would create a high, and then it would sell off for this many days. Man, I shit you not. This, this shit was like I repped that shit like crazy, and my older folks that, uh, that were with me when I was on America Online, um, Gate Trader, who is the guy that won in 2000 the stock division on Robin's Cup. The twenty four percent return, <clears throat> which was respectful back then. Uh, Gate Trader it was a, it, one of my original students when I was on America Online, and there's another guy, Chansom, okay, um, guy up in Alaska. He actually just um, he made I think he made his way into my last mentorship group. Uh, him and his son are going through it together, but uh, they know that I was repping that shit back then, and I was fascinated with it, and I thought that it was like next level shit. So I said, okay, well, if, I don't know how he did that shit. He said he crunched numbers and ran all the, you know, what the market did for this many years. And, and he came out with that output. And I did see it fail sometimes. I mean, it, when it when it failed, it was, you know, like anything else. But when it was on, it was so good. It was very similar to what I just outlined here for the yearly range. Okay. So I gave you the entire map for every single year. Why do you teach that you ought to be under your wing for a year, Michael? Michael, tell me. Well, I got to subscribe to your bullshit for a full year to learn how to trade. I just told you in this video up to, or this 
discussion right now. Because if you don't see it and you're not walked through it with a hand holding, which is what I did in my private mentorship, you can't see it. You won't you won't appreciate how it is consistent. And this is the reason why when I gave my analysis in private mentorship, it's 90 percent accurate. It's logged and ain't a fucking person can say anything about it because it's all been witnessed. It's all there. It's recorded. It's live. It's there all before it happened. And I used the things I'm talking about right here. So I went from using his idea that he was building these little like seasonal tendencies for each individual month to, okay, I want to know what does the weekly range look like on average. And I knew I wouldn't get one that matches everything because everything's going to look different. But I want to reduce it down to what type of weekly range would it look like and what tends to repeat a lot. And those templates is what I share in my core content. Now, <clears throat> the problem is students that see those things, they want me to be able to say, this is what that template's going to be this week when I need Monday's trading. And then I want to see what Tuesday's doing. So it's a matter of knowing what's occurring right then and there. Like I got to be in it. Like I got to, I got to be in there trading. Now there are other times where if you're in those seasonal times, like in the spring to summer months where it's likely to go lower. I'm many times able to say, okay, because of the economic calendar, the way the economic calendar is, and there's a lot of impact news on Wednesday or Thursday. Well, what does that mean? Look at your templates in that core content. Which one has a higher low forming on that Wednesday or Thursday template? And that's the weekly template you're going to be following probably for that week. That's it. I just gave it to you. And if it doesn't pan out, you just eat it. It's a loss like anything else. It's a cost of doing business. But you're going to find that it's almost like fucking fortune telling. It's it's weird. It's weird how it just pans out. But <clears throat> it takes a lot of courage to, to, to see that and experience. You're not going to be able to just look at it and say, oh, I figured this out. It's going to be so easy. But you got to do this. It's, it's, this is a lifestyle. And you'll learn. And then I went to studying how I can do this on an intraday basis. So I had intraday templates or market profiles or little tendencies for the market to do certain little patterns and, and delivery of price. I put it in that type of format too. And you see that in the day trading portion of the core content. So I'm looking at days with the expectation it's going to deliver a certain way. Now, I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I'm not even claiming to be 90% right in that regard. But I know if I fall victim to a intraday profile that I'm trying to trade, if it fails, I know which one it's going to go to if I fail there. And it's a matter of experience and knowing how to navigate that. But narrative is knowing how it's going to use one of those templates. And that's what makes this complicated. And it's easy for people to say, fuck this, it's too hard. He makes it complicated. No. If you want laser guided precision, it's going to take some fucking effort and it's going to put, put some wrinkles on you. Okay, it's going to gray some of your hair. That's just what I require because that's the way I'm wired. I want something that's next fucking level outside the reach of the common person or trader. That's why when you see me executing, that shit is next to flawless. And you can't get those results with this retail horseshit renamed. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It does not exist. And these fucking jokers that say, oh, it's supply and demand. It's not supply and demand. These, these things I'm teaching you are highly specific. They're very specific. It's not an open range that you fucking figure out where you're going to be buying or selling at. Here's your zone. Which Where, where are you buying in that zone? Sam don't even teach you that. <laughs> Sidon. So that logic, while in its infancy, is better than support and resistance, but it's still lacking. And you have to be precise about why are you buying here? And if you don't know where you're buying and why you're buying it, how the fuck can you put your stop loss in an effective place and know that it ain't going to get hit? Look at the trade examples I show you. You see, oh, he's got a $3,000 stop loss there. Whew, that's a lot. Look at the profit target. It's always more than three. Always more than three times. Sometimes more than that. Sometimes five. Sometimes 10. Don't get caught up with the numbers. Look at the logic I'm showing you, why I'm putting my stop loss where I'm putting it. It's exactly how I teach it. 
The algorithm is going to respect that. You, you see, oh man, he's putting a stop loss right there. I couldn't do that because you haven't been doing this long enough and you haven't adopted what? The experience of seeing it. I've handled this stuff for 30 years. I've, I've been in it for three decades. I've seen this shit pan out so many times. I know how to trust it. And if I lose, if I lose at it, it's not a big deal. I know that it will repeat again. And if I took a loss, I can get that back easily. It's easy. Losing is hard for a neophyte. It's, it's impossible to get through a losing set of trades as a new student. You need encouragement. You need to be able to be around other people to, to say, hey, look, I've been there too. And that's one of the benefits of being in a community like this, because I don't want you all to simply saying, here's where I made money. High five, ICT. That's cool. A lot of people like to see that. I like seeing it. And it, it fluffs my ego. I ain't going to lie to you. It feels good to see my students doing well. But I also really want to see folks share where they're fucking up, what they're doing wrong. Because not only will it be an opportunity for you to get me replying to you saying you did this incorrectly and you should have been focusing on that. You'll learn from it and other people will learn from that. But you're all afraid to show what? What I opened this whole presentation up with. You don't, you don't want to show your weaknesses. You don't show where you've done it wrong. And that's where the learning occurs. You don't learn anything when you did it right. That's sugar-coated. That's candy-coated bullshit. You're not going to constantly win. You're going to lose. You're going to lose money. You're going to do it wrong. And how are you going to take that? Are you going to lose your shit and lose your mind about it? And, oh, man, I got to go back in right away and do it. Why? I'll talk about that in a moment. You need to know your model and your market and stop trying to chase whatever the fuck I'm doing. If I'm trying to do something in the marketplace and you have a model already arrived at and, and a particular market that you want to trade in, you can see nobody's been able to convince me to trade in crypto. I'm never going to touch it. <laughs> I'm never going to touch that shit. But you all watch me have an exodus from Forex. And I've given you all the reasons why I have no interest in them going back in because I know shit's coming and I don't want to be wrecked in that. I don't want to be caught up in some deep pegging bullshit. I don't want to be in that at all. And you you can take that risk on if you want to. I'm not talking you out of it. I'm not telling you to stay in it. It's a matter of personal choice. My trust is in stock indices. I went there first. When I started finding consistency, I found it there. That's where I found it, okay, as a commodity trader in 1993. Any consistency, any, any consistency started its formation in that year in stock indices and bonds. That was it. And I was trying to find mega trades and corn and wheat and live cattle and pork bellies and Crude oil and gold, all those uh, copper, cotton, coffee, sugar, and I never touched orange juice again. <laughs> once it once it spanked my ass, it took fifty percent of the option premium in one night. Uh, was it? I was like, yeah, fuck orange juice. You know, I, I, I there for a while. I didn't want to drink. I was so mad about it, but I don't drink it today because it's too acidic. But and they put shit in it now. I don't want to be drinking, but uh, it's another discussion for another day. But you need to know your model and your market. And you want to be back testing, okay, at least a minimum of three months with tape reading interwoven in that. You know, I optimally you want to do it at least for six months. So you can split it up with the first three months of back testing, no tape reading. All hindsight, going back and looking at old data logging it and seeing where the patterns form, what it looked like, how much risk would have been incurred, how many times it would have failed, how many times it would have panned out, where your potential entries would be pyramided if you want to do pyramid. And some of you not, might not want a pyramid. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't let me, because I do it, inspire you to feel like you have to do that. You might be just one entry and go to per, you know first partial or second partial and or go to full target. But don't go to full target when you're first learning. You're going to frustrate yourself because you're going to be doing it wrong. You'll be entering too soon, entering too late, or entering incorrectly, and you're going to try to hold on to something for a full target. This is why, I, like, I'm just going to fucking say it. Tom Dante, he's always talked about me in his little private little circles. Never had the balls to say anything publicly. And he would always say, it doesn't make any sense to take partials because you incur the initial risk 
And then as you take something off, you're not getting paid for the initial risk. I don't give a fuck about that initial risk. Once it starts paying me, I want to get fucking paid. I'm taking something out of the trade. And that logic to me is absolutely asinine. You are in this to make money. You're not in here to say, here, I got a trophy. It went to my target. It, it's going to my target many times. But I don't need it to go to my fucking target. I'm rolling that account up. I'm parlaying that account up. And I'm quickly removing all that leverage that I have tied up in that trade. I can do something else while I'm scaling out. You don't see that shit. That's how I ran these fucking small accounts up. That's how I did it. But you want to listen to these fucking clowns that don't trade. They don't do shit on there. They make these little squilly fucking lines and poor ass jokes. These people don't make fucking money. They don't money. They don't make money. They don't fucking have consistency. But they hate fucking people like me. And I fucking love it. I love it. So back test for three months minimum. And or. Six months of back testing with tape reading. That means when you're tape reading, you're literally sitting in front of the charts watching live data print on the charts, but you're not taking the entries. You're not even pushing a demo account. You're doing it for experience reading the price, watching how it reacts. And then what you're doing is you're, is you're seeing, say, for instance, you're watching the S&P, okay? And you think it's going to go down to a particular level. You know you're drawing liquidity. You, you know it's likely to go lower. You're waiting for the fair value gap to form, and you want to watch and see how it gravitates up into it. How does it react? Does it immediately deliver after it goes into a fair value gap? Does it hang around a little bit and then start moving in your favor? Does it go down and then come back up to it one more time and tap into it, which is the reason why I don't teach trailing your stop loss aggressively, because that's a tendency in the marketplace. The algorithm can come back and touch that fair value gap one more time. And that's a normal thing. You don't see that shit in books. It's just, well, you got stopped out and, you know, maybe you can take another trade. Fuck that. I'm going to go right back in that market. If I get stopped out and everything's true, I'm going to use that retouch of a, a fair value gap later on that I've already entered on because I know they can be reclaimed, recycled, reused, if you will, because they are real support and resistance. You're talking about support and resistance is a joke in, in your mind community. It isn't if you're using the fair value gap. Because you can literally use fair value gaps as points of inversion where once they go through it, then it should act as well. If you're looking at a fair value gap that you thought was going to be bearish and it trades through it, it shows no respect to it. When that bitch comes back down and touches that again on the, on the buy side, I expect a trade there. If everything is equal and I knew I, I, I was wrong on my short idea and it's shown me I'm absolutely wrong. I'm going to buy that fair value gap that I would have been using for a short. Isn't that support and resistance theory? Yes. But the problem is that idea of support and resistance, you don't know what fucking high or low to put it on. Look at everybody on Twitter. Look at everybody on uh, TradingView, on YouTube that uses trend lines. How the fuck did they arrive at those trend lines? And how many times is it really respecting it? They'll draw it after it's happened. Oh, look at this. This is where it touched. No, draw that fucking line before the market comes down and touches it and reacts. I don't see that ever. I don't ever see that. I'm always looking for it, but I never see that shit. But how many times have you seen me and my fucking students recording our entries and management, and it's beautifully respecting the fucking things that we're doing to the fucking level right there. Bang. Laser guided precision. Poor Goldman Sachs boys. So you got initially right away going into anything with me you got a minimum of six months of never pushing a button because you need to know how you're going to react to seeing price are you going to be palm sweaty and anxious about it and you're not even in a demo because you want to be right and you're going to see how removing the idea of being right or wrong take the game aspect out of it because that's bullshit because this is not a fucking game it's not a fucking video game. This will wreck your fucking ass. It'll ruin your shit if you don't know what you're doing. So you got to respect this risk. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But you want to be listening to your internal dialogue of what you think you see in the charts. And then you want to write that down and screenshot it as you're doing it. And you're tape reading. You're not just simply watching price. When you think you see something, you screen capture that. And you quickly put an annotation in there. What you think. You, can't, you don't have time to be fully automating 
the 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 narrative in a, in a text format. You're literally just trying to encapsulate that moment, what you thought you saw, and then there it is. So the way you could do this is pre-type on TradingView or whatever platform you're using, fair value gap, bearish, fair value gap, bullish, draw on liquidity, and stop loss, um, first partial, have those already on your chart. And then when when it's doing what you think it is, drag that little text over there. You see me typing it out because I'm proving that I'm doing this live. Okay, everybody bitches about, oh, it's a cherry pick. Bullshit. Dude, I'm doing it right next to these other guys that are doing live streaming. I'm not going to live stream. I'm not going to do that. I cannot do that and think clearly about what I'm doing. But there's no denying that what I'm doing is I, I can only be typing and annotating and managing a stop on one chart. In trading view, if you're working with a, 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 a whether it be demo or your live account, you can only do one account. They're, they're not letting you run two. <laughs> it's the same fucking account. So all that shit goes out the fucking uh, the window when you really take a step back and say, okay, no, this shit's really happening. It's really happening. Yes. And you won't even worry about that nonsense if you start doing the things I'm talking about. Go look at old data, study it, get your, your back data stuff. How many times it's formed when it failed? And what does that look like? I'm absolutely going to do that for you in 2023. When we come back together again in February, I know it doesn't seem like I even went away yet, has it? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in February, I'm going to start off with doing the very things I'm talking about right here. I'm going to show you how to literally go into back testing. How I'm going to literally sit down and back test. I don't know how long I'm going to do it, but I'm going to show you exactly what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, what you're supposed to be doing. And then we're going to be doing live tape reading the rest of the fucking year. That means I'm going to pull out points in the marketplace where I want you to study. And I'm going to show you where I think the draw on liquidity is. And I want you to listen because I'm going to prompt you. I'm not going to say this is a short. I'm not going to say this is a buy. I'm going to say, what do you see right now? You're going to know based on that model in 2022 that's on YouTube right now. It ain't going to change. It's not going to manifest into another form of it. Okay, it's not going to mutate and have 15 other things added to it. I'm just simply going to say, what do you see right now? I'm not going to be on Twitter looking for your res you know, responses. I'm not going to be looking at the chat room ever because I know there's going to be horseshit in there. I don't give a fuck because they're going to see consistency next year. They're going to see it and they're going to choke on it. But you're going to learn from it. You're going to benefit from it. You're going to see exactly what this algorithm does, when it's supposed to do it, why it's supposed to do it, and then how consistent you can be in knowing where it's going to go. Because that's that crutch that many of you need. And that's what my private mentorship had. They had that crutch of my experience of saying, this is where it's going to go on the daily chart, and it's going to reach for these levels on the intraday. So they had that going in. All they had to do is use what they learned in mentorship. They learned that model. I didn't spell it out just like that, but I've actually used that model many times in my examples. So it's not like I created just for that. The whole process of outlining it was for my daughter to say, okay, here's what you can do. This is what I think you can do. And she's not interested in trading. So, so you got six months of back testing and, and tape reading. After six months, okay, then you go into a minimum minimum of three months of demo trading. Now, I personally say six months of consistency. If you think for a fucking second that you are ready to go with a live account before at least what I've said here and expect consistency, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to blow your account. You don't even know yourself. You're going to ruin yourself and you're going to be a statistic. You're going to be an ICT statistic where, you know, the people that rush through it and try to do it quicker, they fail and they think the shit don't work because of that. Anybody else's stuff, when they rush to go through it, there it is. It's failure. Well, it's you. It's you. You're trying to do it too fast. And you haven't seen a full year. You haven't appreciated the level of consistency and the ideas as the market dynamics I've outlined here. They happen all the time, folks. How do you think I'm finding all these examples all the time? I mean, think about it. Okay, if it's so easy to cherry pick it, I want to see somebody else do it. <laughs> cherry pick it. Do it. You can do both sides of the marketplace. Record one trade going one way and one trade going the other way, but it better be fucking precise entries like mine. 
and it better hit targets and you better be moving a stop loss to enter the time when you put it in there. Don't be putting no 24 contracts or 40 contracts on a simulator account where it ain't even being recorded and say you made $45,000. That shit don't fucking float, okay? So three months minimum demo. Minimum. And I'm suggesting you should do six. Because if you are six months consistently following the rules and the model in the only market you're going to be trading, but ICT, which one am I going to trade? You, you, do I trade the ES? Do I trade the NASDAQ? Do I trade the US 100? Do I trade the US 500? The US 30 or the Dow? Which one do I trade? Whatever one you settle on. Don't let me influence that. You're, you already know which market you want to trade. You're just looking for me to co-sign it or somebody else that might be making money consistently. That's what it is. Everybody wants to see, what are you trading? Synthetic indices. I don't know anything about that shit. I don't know if my stuff works. I've never even, I don't even know what that is. But I have a lot of African folks that will ask me that, and I don't know what that is. Or do you trade the volatility index? I don't fucking trade that. No way. You see what I trade. I'm trading ES or NASDAQ. That's it. That's it. It's a simple, small little universe. If I had to trade just one, yes, and I would never, ever, ever need to do anything else ever again. I wouldn't have to look at any other charts ever. Just a yes. All I got to do is look at it in the springtime and see when, when there's a divergence to set me up the, the sell model. And I look for it in the fall to be a buy model. And that's it. I don't need to look at anything else because everything else is going to be in that chart for ES or whatever market you're trying to follow. But if you want to have ridiculous insight <clears throat> and you want to have the the prowess that you see me demonstrated and you see my students demonstrating in their examples, you, they're out there recording themselves doing it. They're on their own little YouTube channels in their own little lane doing their own thing. And I'm not telling them to get in those trades. And man, that fucking feels amazing. It feels amazing seeing them able to do that. Like I, I love showing my sons. I show my wife, look at this guy. Look, he just did there. Look, and then when I share my examples, I'm recording. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what trades I'm taking. And then I put it up there, and then everybody comes behind me. Look at this. I took the same trade, and they recorded their same shit. There's no fucking way you can go back in time. Record all that compressed data, all that delivery and price, annotations, all the bullshit. There's no way that can be faked. That means there was a transfer of knowledge from me to them. That's proof of concept. That is proof the shit works. And it means if they can do it, you can fucking do it. And don't let no fucking clown anywhere tell you you can't. Because I'm telling you, you can. You absolutely can. I've made this obtainable for all of you. Yes, it takes work. Everything does. Every fucking thing takes work and effort. It's going to be a hard press for some of you. It's going to be easier for others. And you have to find out what it's going to be for you. But you just simply got to dig your heels in. Dig your heels in, say, fuck it. You know, I'm going to put up with whatever I got to put up with. I already know it's going to be hard because if it ain't rough, it ain't right. That's just the way it is. Because if it was easy, 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 everybody could do it. And you don't see that. You don't see it. So you have a full, complete year if you do it right, optimally. You know, six months of back testing and, and tape reading, and then three to six months of consistently aiming for a demo results or you know a track record if you want to go so far as to say that for six months that are consistently profitable then then and only then are you prepared mentally emotionally to even consider and i'm not saying that you should do it but then is when you should consider putting real money in and that's a decision you're going to make there's no ICT lesson that says, okay, this is the deciding factor. This is when ICT says I should do it. No, you are going to make that decision. Some of you may never do, do it. You may be too scared, and that's fine. That means you can't do it. But if you're good in demo, you can run signal services and you make money doing that. I got students that are doing it. They're not even on a live account. They can't take the personal risk on themselves. That's their weakness. So what they've done is, okay, I'm good in a demo. But I can't do well when it's money because I'm, I'm I I take the losing trades and it affects me mentally. Okay, well, why don't you just run a signal service? Because if you're confident in your demo and you know it's not going to hurt you, there's no kryptonite there. And if you're consistent, there it is, and they're running that. 
there it is. <laughs> I mean, is there anything wrong with that in my opinion? Fuck no. No, because if the people that are subscribing to someone like that, they already know if it's going to work, they're going to keep subscribing. If it doesn't work, they're not going to subscribe and continue. So everybody's getting what they're looking for. There's a lot of people out there that can't trade. They can't trade. They can't do the, the pushing of the button. They can't absorb the uncertainty that is inherent in this industry. And there's a lot of uncertainty. And it stems internally. Because if you can take yourself out of the equation, all you're doing is looking for a market that's going to go up or go down. And where is it going to go up to or where is it going to go down to? And where's the market at right now? Has it created an imbalance? Has it taken stops? There's a, that's the questions you're asking. But see, what you do and I did when I was younger, I bring all our horse shit to it. Wife left me. I don't feel well. I'm not able to bench press this much. My friends are doing better than me in their job. Fucking Carl's got the market spot again this month. Everything's going to be a plague and a distraction. And you're going to bring all that nonsense into your decision making. And you're going to clutter up this whole thing. And I think, I personally think that subconsciously, I think we as humans like to do that because it provides us a perfect excuse why we fail. Oh, of course we're going to fail. I have all these other things to contend with. No, you didn't. You brought that shit into trading. You got to find a way to be able to remove all that, that outward influence, these, these outward factors that will plague anybody. doesn't matter if you have a high aptitude in terms of intelligence or if you're just a common person like I was when I came into this. I, I mean, I, I'm not an intellectual giant. I'm not, I'm not superior in, in my intellect. I'm, I'm, I'm a blue collar guy. Like I'm straight out of freaking Middle River, Maryland. I mean, I'm like that is the definition of blue collar. They called, our, they called our neighborhood Cardboard City. Literally. It doesn't exist anymore. They built um, new, I think it was Ryan Homes or Ryland Homes. I think they put uh, those over there. Right across the street from uh, Middle River School. My address as a kid was 30 Henderson. And it was literally right across the street from Middle River. But you, you, you got to find a way to keep that stuff from coming in. You can't invite it. We're about halfway there, folks. <laughs> Hope you packed the fucking lunch. Know and respect the risk. Okay, and now obviously, that's the part everybody wants to ignore. Well, I just want to win. Just show me how to win. I don't want to know about a stop loss. I know I, know I should use a stop loss, ICT, but I don't know where to fucking put it, so I'm not going to use it. And then when you blow your account or you go in severe drawdown, what do you feel then? Weigh out that right now, okay? If you haven't even started pushing a button yet, weigh out the, the, the pressure of fearful of knowing where to put a stop loss versus not using a stop loss and regretting it and how bad it can be before you either get out or they margin call you. Which one do you want to suffer through? Obviously, you want to flounder in the beginning of learning where to put a stop loss. And that's the benefit of giving yourself time. Folks, This that stuff is a complicated thing. You can't just simply say, here's the rules, because I've already done that. I've already shown you how the, where to put a stop loss. The fair value you got, where's the high of the fair value you got? Okay, if you allow yourself in terms of the risk to have it to the swing high behind the high that forms the fair value gap, I'm going to use the swing high. But if I know everything's in my favor, I'll use the high of the candle that makes the fair value gap. And that's where my stop loss is. And you see how the market performs. Look at my examples this week. Don't look at the total amount of money that was being risked. Look at the precision placement of the stop loss and how it was never in jeopardy. I was not sitting there watching those fucking trades thinking, I hope it doesn't hit my stop. The stop's there to do its job. It's being paid to do its job. Get me out at that price because I don't want to be in it going higher or lower if it's moving against me. I'm not worrying about that stop loss. I'm focusing on the price moving in where I'm expecting it, the draw on liquidity. I'm focusing on is the market continuously giving me all signatures and signs that it's doing what I expect it to do? Is it breaking with it? If I'm bearish, I want to see up-close candles being broken. 
I want to see price digging through up close candles to the left. That means it's eating into all that shit. And I want to see up close candles. I mean, I mean, I think I may have said this wrong. Let me, let me take a step back here. Yeah. If I'm bearish, I want to see down close candles being broken because down close candles in a bullish market, I, I'll look for opportunities for that to support price either through mitigation or outright order block. So I'm looking for down close candles to be driven through in price action when I'm bearish. Because otherwise, if you start seeing these down close candles to the left starting to support price, then you might need to suffer through a retracement or it could have made its low. So I'm looking for those signatures while price is delivering in my trade. I'm focusing my attention there. I'm not worrying about or panicking about the stop loss being hit. And that's where all of your mindsets are as a new trader and those that don't want to put a stop loss. You know if you put that stop loss order in there and you may have a limit order in to get out above or below based on whatever you're doing if you're going long or short. You'll put a limit order in to get out, but you're afraid to use that fucking stop loss order because you know you're doing this too soon. But you can't help it. You want to get a win. You want to make money because you think that that's going to be the, the, the decision maker or the confirmation that what you're doing is the right thing. When really what you're doing is, is you're solidifying bad habits. You are ensuring that you're going to be a piss poor trader forever. That long pause is intended. I wanted you to hear that and register. If you trade without a stop loss, like a dumb Yahoo, you are setting yourself up for inconsistency. I promise you, look at everybody out there that's trading without a stop loss. They, they, they're, they're emotional. They flip out. When it's wrong, it's fucking really bad. And they can't fix it. You can't go back and, oh, uh, I mean, let me limit the, the, the amount of drawdown I took. No, it's too late. So you have to have that time to learn how to trust yourself. Stop listening to these fucking clowns selling courses and bullshit, trying to get you to be a part of their groups, following their bullshit flawed logic. That you, you just don't use a stop loss or put a stop loss so, so tight that it's unreasonable. And or they're saying... Do live trading sooner because ICT's an old man and he's a fuddy duddy and he's setting his ways and there's newer ways to do it. There's new technologies. There's new ways to get in there and start making money right away. Those technologies may very well be valid, but you still are you and you are bringing in to this equation your frailties as a human being, your character flaws, your personality disorders. Everybody has something wrong. That hasn't been dealt with. Nobody walked into trading with their shit right. Nobody. They discover a lot of the things that they didn't notice about themselves. And the better ones, the traders that are consistently profitable, they're the ones that have done the work and the painful pruning in their personal life, in their mindset, their thought processes, all these things have been augmented to get themselves in alignment with allowing success. But you don't see what you're doing. You're, you're resisting success by doing all the wrong things, thinking you're protecting yourself from the things that you've identified that is fearful, which is being wrong or losing money or ultimate failure. And that is avoided by doing the very things I'm telling you to do. You have to learn how to encounter, well, those personal wrestling matches is where you, you – don't like what you feel about yourself. You, you may be wrestling with the fact that you think it should have been easier for you to learn by now. I have so many students that have went through that and then look back and say, you know what? I made a big deal about it then. And I felt like it was longer than it really was. And now I'm looking back. It's like I made a bigger deal out of that shit than it really was. And I kept myself in that situation longer because I grieved about it should have been sooner. It should have been sooner instead of just doing the fucking work and getting you through it. When you join the military, 
boot camp. They put your ass through it for six weeks or so. And look, soft bodies going in there, they're not soft bodies after six weeks. <laughs> uh, they're not soft bodies and they're ready to rip your shit up. They're salty. They're ready to get out there and beat somebody's ass because the drill sergeants or whatever put it on them. So they're going to deflect and put it on whoever they say is the enemy. Well, you need to go into your development with the same mindset. It's going to suck. You're not going to have that sugary snack every day. You're going to have to defer all those little things on the weekend and start studying and doing those things that are uncomfortable that may not pan out for you right away, but the end result over time will, you got to just stay with it. But you have to respect that risk. And if you don't know what your personal risk percentage is, what's the maximum that you can really suffer? And you're going to like, oh, I can take 2%. Some of you younger guys, well, ICT said he did 5%. So I could, I could do 5%. Yeah, I could do that. No, you can't. No, you can't. If you had an account with $100,000, you feel rich because you have $100,000. But if you lose $5,000, you start thinking, wait a minute, that's, 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 that's $5,000. I mean, I could have done this and that. And all of a sudden, you start thinking about, oh, you got buyer's remorse now. <laughs> Um, if I wouldn't have done that trade, I could have bought uh, this or that. I could have done that project around the house. I could have put the deck on the back porch and I could have done this and done that. And I could have fixed this in the car. What are you doing? You're bringing in weaknesses and character flaws. Instead of saying, okay, I did that wrong. I risked 5%. That's stupid. It's over leveraging. Don't do that. Don't let the industry standard in all the books and even I have parroted this stuff. 2% is not optimal. Anybody that says it's optimal is full of shit. They're lying. And they're probably not even profitable. Your risk percentage, the maximum of that risk for your total equity in your account, it might only be one half of 1%. And you can trade very fluidly in the marketplace and not feel any kind of unnerved, no second doubts about what you're doing while you're trading, where your stop loss is. If you get stopped out, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to hurt you. And a half of 1% is easy to make back. Really, really easy to make that back, regardless of whatever your equity size is. So the secret sauce in this whole business is knowing you, how you are going to derail yourself. Are you easily swayed by other people's opinion, even mine? You might be looking at a market, and I have students that have discovered this in my private mentorship. They have an uh, idea about a marketplace, okay? And because I'm using higher time frame, my, my outlook is a little bit longer term than them if I'm talking about a daily chart. But they might have an idea about taking a trade that would be opposed to that idea. Not, not necessarily nothing wrong with that, but because their mentor was saying he believes or I believe that it's going to go here. It made them second guess their own analysis. And then, then that trade they were going to try to take panned out. And my stuff still ended up going there, but days later. My entire time frame for bias. Theirs was, I'm taking money out of the marketplace tomorrow in the next session. But because I was giving my analysis, they were tripped up by my opinion. My opinion should not have any influence over yours. Once you have your own model... You should not be subscribing to whatever I think is going to happen in the marketplace. That's the whole decoupling that's required for you to be an independent thinker. And that's why I, that's one of the benefits of me not doing active mentoring now. I'm just answering questions and finalizing our, our time together as the private mentorship group. And ultimately that, you know, that will move, move aside and they'll integrate themselves with this community here. But You'll see them rise above everyone else in this group because they've been trained a little bit better than all of you are. And that's not something you should be upset about because you have me still here actively teaching. And don't be upset about that. You're not, you're not going to get in, in what they've had. You're not going to get that. So just accept it. There's nothing wrong with you not being a part of that. They took the risk and took the initiative to get in it when it was avail made available to them and they did it. <clears throat> not all of them are successful, but I have a lot of them that are. And the ones that are still struggling have now found their development increasing. And some of them are profitable now because of what you watched and had for free just this year.
So I know it's profitable. I know it's helping other people and even my students that were struggling. But your risk percent, you need to know what that is. And you're not going to know what that is until you spend six months, ideally, tinkering with it. Where have you worked with it? Because 2%, you know, it's not a lot. But if you have 2% and then you cut the loss and you risk 1% and you lose and you risk a half percent of that, okay, you know, that's 3.5%. 3.5% doesn't feel like a lot. But what happens if you take another loss and you're stuck at one quarter percent? And you have to do that over and over and over again. It will not run your account down like 2% every single time. But if you start with a half a percent and you take a loss, it's going to feel like a mosquito bite. It's a nuisance. You wish it didn't happen, but it's really not bothering you. But if you keep going back into it and scratching it, it's going to do what? Potentially get infected, create an open sore. And that's what you end up doing when you start treating your losing trades like a mosquito bite. You want to just keep itching it. It's done. It's damaged. Let it go. Just leave it alone. Ignore it. Move on to the next thing. But your risk has to be unique to you. Don't just take the industry standard that everybody regurgitates 2%. Because that's too high for a new student. It's too high. Too fucking high. And there's people out there that will claim that you got to push it. you got to know when to push it. How are you going to know when to push it if you've only been messing around for a couple months? Seriously, answer that question. How could anybody reasonably expect to know their reactions, their expectations, how they're going to react to the profit if it starts moving in their favor? You, you want to know what's scary? Being in a move that you didn't expect to be so rapid and sudden and you didn't have a limit order in yet and it starts railing in your favor. That's terrifying. As a new student, it's thrilling as shit, but it's terrifying because you're like, what do I do? You're like a deer in headlights. That's scary as shit. You think losing money is scary. Now, that's that's regret. And you're just fearful of doing it the next time. But when you're in a winning trade that you didn't expect to be that powerful and you didn't have a limit order placed in, it just, it's, it's just running like crazy. That's a terrifying feeling. Like you get paralyzed. You're afraid to get out because it. what if it keeps running? And you're afraid to stay in it because what if it's going to reverse? That's a weird feeling for a new student to experience. And you have to have time for those things to creep in. And it teaches you a lot about yourself. And books don't talk about that stuff. All the books I've ever read, they don't ever talk about what I'm talking about here. Even Mark Douglas' book, as good as it is, is a classic. He doesn't, really, he doesn't really hammer all these things and really put it in a way where, hey, you know, let's just talk about it vaguely. No, these these are things that you're going to deal with and they're going to impact your trading. They're going to really have an impact on how you develop and how you manage yourself as a trader. And you can't just take industry standards or things that are tossed around as you know, that's what that's going to be a perfect fit for you. No, like you have to you have to determine what is optimal for you. And it may be less than one percent risk or it might be just one percent. Others might thrive with 3% risk. I think that's a little nuts for a new trader, but hey, you know, you know yourself. And respecting the risk and understanding that comes with it. With my, my advice is only use 30% of your equity. Okay. So when you have these like funded accounts, like, yeah, I got a hundred thousand dollar funded account. You want to get out there and you want to maximize that $100,000 leverage they're giving you. You don't have $100,000 really, but they're giving you the buying power or selling power of $100,000 equivalent. I'm telling you, only use $30,000 of it. You will not blow your account. You won't wreck it. You won't get you know, drunk with the idea of making big money. You want to make consistent money. And if it works out that you're only making $500 a week, fuck anybody else that has a problem with that. Who gives a shit? That's $500. That's bread going in your pocket. That's grocery money. That's paying your car note or a uh, utility bill. Fuck everybody else's opinion. There's too much of that shit going on to getting you wrapped up and caught up in all this keeping up with Jones's shit. You're here and you're in this industry to do one thing. Make money. That's it. It's not a fucking hobby. It's not fantasy football. It's not this team against that team. <clears throat> it's you trying to make money. Hang on, I gotta 
Put some oil in the engine here. What do you drink in ICT? Evian spring water made from the French Alps. It's good shit. But when you when you respect the risk and you're only trading with 30% of your equity, the idea is if you're new, and I've seen so many times, like I, I fell victim to this too. When I first started really wanting to make big money, I was like, I'm undercapitalized. Like I don't have enough. And I took bigger risk than I should have, thinking I'm going to shorten the span of time that required to get to a bigger account. Because if I get a bigger account, I can make big money consistently. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen is if you trade with a small account and you risk really big and you win, you're like, oh, well, I'm going to do that again. And if you get lucky there, what are you going to do the next time? Even bigger. Well, that's when the inevitable happens. You have that losing trade that becomes a losing series of trades because now you're regretful that you did what you did. You knew damn well you shouldn't have done that. So you're going to try to hurt. Just let me get back to what I had. You know, I made $10,000 in the last three trades con you know, combined, and I just took it all down and down, you know, only up $7,100. I shouldn't have done that. Let me just you know, let me try to just get it back to 10000 How many times have you been in that situation? Maybe not 10000 but you've, you've been there, right? You've had an equity high. You knew damn well you should have stopped. You got through there. You got you, you took a trip through hell, and you got out before the devil knew you were there. And you just decided to go back in there one more fucking time. And it burned your ass. And now you can't stomach the idea that you did it. You just want to fix it. What happens if you did that one more time and you fix it? It's going to reassure what you did was the right thing, and it's the wrong thing. You need to say, okay, my impulsive nature, my weaknesses, my frailty as a human being is saying I should go back in and fix that. Your trader and the analyst need to have a conversation internally and say, okay, what's the probabilities of me getting back to that equity high? What's the probabilities of me losing more? What benefit is there for me to risk more when I'm still up like I am? So the analyst talks common sense into the trader. And the trader, if it's not being a gambler, because there's three people in every, every one of us in trading. The analyst, the trader, and the gambler. The gambler is going to be the person that's going to look at somebody else's results and say, I can do better than that. Over leverage in a simulator account without a, without a stop loss just to say they can do something. Impulsive. Look at this. Look at that. But not hide, but, but hide the trade so that way you don't see it. Because if it fails, you don't get to know it. He did it. Or she did it. You need to be responsible with yourself and know that I'm feeling impulsive. I'm feeling reckless. And I'm allowing my character flaws and personality disorders to impact my decisions about making money or preserving capital. And preserving capital is the number one rule in this business. Because if you don't have capital, you can't do shit. No money makes no money. It's, it's going to be the same as a demo. You can push a button and see a result, but you can't pay your groceries with that. It's going to have to come from real money. So trading with 30% of your equity ensures that you're never over leveraging. And if you can't make money with 30,000, I'm, I'm going to say this. Okay, I was going to do it in the live discussions with Corpse because we're planning something in January. I'm going to say this now so that way it's out of my, it's out of my system and I don't think it's venomous. Okay. But he made a remark the other day. I was in his live stream. He was talking about somebody saying uh, a $50,000 account or whatever. He, he doesn't believe he can, anyone can make money with that. Uh, I, I disagree, and I may have misheard what he was referring to. But for anyone that thinks that they have to have 100000 or more for leveraging to make money, uh, to me, that is unfortunate because you can make money with 10000 Okay, you can make money with fifteen thousand. You can make money with twenty five thousand. You don't need fifty thousand. You don't need that. And I want, I want you to listen to how I'm going to close this session. We're not there yet, but I'm going to try to give you a, an idea of going forward in 2023 to keep it sober for you. But when you when you're only losing a very small fractional part of your total equity, no. Of the 30% of your total equity. So if you're looking at your account, it's 100,000 leverage. 
that you can use in your funded account, trade like you have a $30,000 account. And stop worrying about measuring up. Okay, don't be, I guarantee you, all of you simply want to be able to go onto social media and you're fucking smiling right now because you know it's you. You want to be able to say, look what I just took out of my funded account. You want that big fat 70,000 like the other young man did a, a couple months ago that was in my fold. Got up on a leaderboard and FTML. All of you want to do that or better now. Don't do that. That's, that's not what you should be doing. You're not out here trying to compete with other people. You're trying to make fucking money. That's it. Everybody blows their account because they're trying to do bigger than they're supposed to be. Trying to reach beyond their means. Do Olympic feats. Fuck that. <laughs> There's a lot of you that are really uh, sober minded about it. And you're like, There's no way I would even do a Robin's Cup. I would never do a trading competition. Because you know that their your personal frailties would creep in and the competition aspect would cloud your mind and your decision making, and you'd blow up. You'd try to overperform, take bigger risks than you're supposed to, and you crash and burn. And that's exactly what happens. That's why I love watching it every year. Every single year, I screen capture every single day. Every single day. And I study who's coming up, who's coming down. And I, I think it's an amazing site. You should do it too. You can see how they, they're hugely over leveraging their positions. And when they make money, they're really coming up a lot. Uh, there was a guy, Kevin Stufflebeam, uh, last year. He went up to like 1300%, like in, in real stunning, quick fashion, like crazy speed, like it was good. But I also knew that he was crazily over leveraged. And I said, you know, if this guy was smart, he would just sit still because he's the highest next to Larry Williams. He was the second highest person in the uh, futures division. Kevin Stufflebeam. He ended up winning with like 300 and some percent, but he came down a thousand percent. So I know he was, he was drunk. Like, I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep it. Dude, you had it. Like it was in lock. And that's all anyone, and so what anybody needs to do is to simply get to that number two spot in the ranks and just sit there and everybody will break themselves trying to get there. And that's what happens every single year. The whole leaderboard rotates in and out, in and out, in and out, because they're all trying to push hard, really hard, overly reaching for things that are not necessary. Because 90% of the traders in there are going to do that same thing. So if the students that are listening to me that are going to go in there next year, let me hold it to the end. Okay, I, I want to close on a good note. Not that any of this shit ain't good because it's all good stuff. Sugar high. So if we, <laughs> so if you are only trading with 30% of your equity, you're removing the likelihood of blowing your account because you're only trading with 30% of your money. And then you're doing what? You're doing your percentage risk per trade based on 30,000, not 100,000. Oh, this is bullshit. You can't make money with that. Bullshit. Bullshit. You can make money with any money. Stop thinking little money, you know, can't make money. You just got to submit to time more. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. You want to be patient. It, 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 think about what you're feeling, that sense of impatience right now. You're all impatient. And I understand I was impatient too. But you all are expecting unrealistic results in such an unrealistic time span. Like you honestly believe that you're going to make $100,000 in two months of live trading with a funded account without any level of stress. The only way you're going to do that is over leveraging and taking nuts, you know, levels of, uh, of leverage and risk. Why? Your whole business model should be, I want to be consistent, know that my trades will work more times than they fail. I will not be affected adversely mentally or psychologically. When I take a losing trade, it means absolutely nothing. It's a tax. That's it. And when you adopt that mindset, you will not doubt the market condition that you're trading in. Because if you're not fearful of losing money or if you do take a loss, it's going to be so infantile, so in, insignificant that it won't matter if you do take a loss. That means you're going to trade better. You'll be able to go in, trade, just like you probably feel when you're trading on a demo account, like one of the students I have. Phenomenal trader when it's demo. Like precision, crazy, nice, really good. 
put him in a live account, short circuits. Because he's not from a country that has a lot of money. And money being taken from him, it's, it's, it's astronomical pressure. It's risk that he can't absorb it. He can't do it. And that's a byproduct of not doing this for a length of time where you condition yourself to being bored with the results. When you make it so consistent, you're doing it in a position where you're not making real money or taking real losses, but you're bored with the process that you keep doing it over and over again, and it's consistent. Then when you creep into a small, small little account, the smallest account that you can start with, and you just dabble with it like that, and you build in a level of comfort of growing in equity, and you add a little bit more. After three months, put a little bit more money in. You ease into it. Not I'm going to get funded and try to get $8,000 in funding and just go crazy. Do over leverage everything. And if I lose half the accounts, who gives a shit? Because I got $4 million leverage still. That's not doing it efficiently. That's dumb. You need to be consistent about what you're doing. And if you do these things, you will not be fearing losing. You can't blow your account because you're under leveraged on all your trades. You're under leveraged. See, you're all looking for 500 to one brokers. Hey, ICT, what broker do you have that would be a good broker for me? I'm in this country. I don't want to use this one since 500 to one. 500 to one, that's fucking stupid. Like, that's fucking dumb. <laughs> that's nuts. That is literally worse than casino odds. Like, that's guaranteed you're losing your ass. That's the really real shit there, okay? Don't even think that you got to do that. If you can't make money with 10 to 1 odds or leverage, you can't trade. In Robbins, you're forced to use the margins that the industry's forced on all traders. I understand, okay? I understand that there are discount brokers, and my son has used it with AMP. They allow you to trade with $300 per contract on the S&P. And I think like $500 for... Uh, the NASDAQ futures. I might have it wrong or whatever, but the leverage that or margin requirements that's there is extremely low. It's not surprisingly, that's the same margins that Larry Williams was using in 1987. Put your thinking caps on. <laughs> but in Robbins, see, that's an area where traders go to measure up. That's why I always insist on Robbins because gambling, over leveraging, and YOLO trading, I don't give a fuck what you make doing that. That's not skill. That is not fucking skill. That's gambling. And if I go into a casino and sit down at a, a poker table, I would get my asses, well, get my ass, rather, beat by everyone else sitting at the table because I'm not a gambler. They know when to over leverage their stock and just go in there and just do that. And they're willing to accept losing that. I am not willing to accept losing YOLO trading. If you're going to compete, you're going to go in a, a setting where everybody is on the same playing field and we all have to use the industry standards. And you're going to have to fucking trade really well. You can't save your ass with doing 20 contracts to get me out of a fucking drawdown. That won't happen in Robbins. Put your money on that one. But when you got some mean motor scooter that's 50 years old, it can take one contract and have 100% return in five weeks when the competition took over a year to get 100% in 4X. And that's their track record. That's the one they tout. Shit don't add up, does it? When the whole broker statements are opened up, logged in, TD Ameritrade, boom, 100%. And I was teaching traders the very things on this, bullet, on, on this bullet point list of things I have here, I have about a half page still, in case you're wondering. You need to refresh your drinks and such. The idea of all my students in my mentorship group, I have different user groups and such, and some of them were like, hey, can you show us with a live account massive drawdown and come back? And can you show us if you take losing trades in the beginning of the day, how you can fix it in the afternoon? And can you just show us how money management alone can fix poor trading? Because I believe that's the case. And I'm going to go so far as to say, as much respect as I have for Larry Wins, because he's the, really my first real mentor, 
Um, there's a lot of shit about him on the internet. People still talk about him. People that talk about me still talk about Larry Williams in the same regard. And he got himself into some trouble. You know, you know I, uh, FBI picked him up. I think in Australia, they supposedly doing it for like tax evasion or whatever. And I had that wrong or something like that. But and, and people question what he did in the Robins Cup and whatever. You know, look, here's the bottom line: his account statements are online. You can Google them. You'll see every single one of them. Nobody has ever got close to his shit, ever, not one time. <sighs> I'm getting ready to go into the end of the conversation already because I'm just chomping at the bit to do it, <laughs> but. When, when Larry Williams said that uh, he's not a good trader, I believe that. When he won in 1987, what was his recipe for success? Holding to the close. So when he was right, if he was buying, he's buying, you know, after the open is done its run lower, and then he's buying strength. That was, his, that was his strategies, okay? I didn't like doing it. I tried doing it. I lost my ass all the time doing it because I couldn't suffer through the retracements that always took place. He would have these extremely wide-ass stops and just, you know, that's YOLO. And he did the maximum leverage using Kelly principle and uh, Kelly criterion. And everything that he could potentially put on, he was putting it on, on his trades. And the only saving grace was when he was right buying early or selling early in the day and holding the S&P or the bond market for the whole daily range. Think about what you would have done if you would have done something like on a CPI day or uh, not, maybe not necessarily what he would have done or what you would have done on yesterday's non-farm payroll, but imagine 60 handles, but we didn't have moves back then like that. Like that, that was not, that wasn't the flavor of the volatility then. We had very, very small volatility. And if we got like five handles you know, eight handles a day, you know, that was considered a, a respectable range of, of S&P movement. And that now, that's a stop loss. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's insane how much volatility is in the marketplace. You young guys, okay, when I say that, those that are like 30 years old and younger, or maybe even 35 and younger, you have no idea what it's like where, when we were coming up. Like me, like, I, you know, and Larry Williams, he's been doing longer than me, 50 years plus, okay? So he admits from his own lips that he's not a good trader. But he's a good money manager, and that's how he won 1987 Robin's Cup. He pushed it, and he allowed the effects of money management to do its thing. So at, apart from the six or seven things I taught individual students, and I told them they would see the results of it on specific days when I shared my statements, that's on my YouTube channel. Okay, Everybody's saying, can you show us losing trades? There are, it's froth with losing trades. It's, there's lots of losing trades. That was the whole premise of why I was trying to teach my students. Don't be fearful of it. Don't be fearful of that. And they had to do it with one contract. One contract, 100% in five weeks with lots of losing trades, lots of them. When I wasn't teaching specific lessons to students' requests with live account, because much like all of you out here in the public, they never saw me. They never, no one's ever seen a live account by me, ever. I've never made it public ever. I've never done that until this year. I shared something with you and I teased and I baited a goofball down in Texas because I want him to look at that. And he made a big deal about it. Oh, look at this precision. Yeah, challenge that. Come into the Robin's Cup for real. Log into your account. Prove that you got an email from Chelsea almost a month ago that you really are registered. Sign in, show your account number. I will do the same thing. I'll match you on balance and I will beat your fucking ass at Robin's Cup. I will immortalize you as a fucking loser. But that won't happen because he's scared. But I proved with that TD Ameritrade account just with money management alone, just the money management principles alone, just like Larry Williams illustrated for a whole year of it, do 100% over five-week intervals. If you keep doing 100% every five weeks, what do you get? <laughs> yeah. A world record and it doesn't matter what balance you start with because it's all percentage right so you're all worried about being perfect and not losing money when you should be worrying about risk and learning how to manage yourself i literally no fucking bones about it i literally sat there in that account when i wasn't answering individual questions i sat there and my son sat with me i flipped my fucking coin and said okay here it is 
If it lands on tails, I have to be a seller. If it lands on, you know, the opposite, I got to be a buyer. And I have to do that. And I have to use money management to get out of all of it. That's what my TD Ameritrade account was. And it still beats the shit out of everybody else you see on YouTube. You see these people struggling on Twitter? That account has not been updated since November 4th, Sam. And you said you were in the Robins Cup. I expect to see your ass update that MyFX book or get in the Robins in 2023 like you said you would officially. The bullshit's done. We're, we're done. We're past all that stuff. It's time for the real show. It's time for a new world record. It's time for these talkers to get shut the fuck down. We have two more subjects and we're done. Hang in there. All right. So you know the results come from submitting to the process. Now, obviously, you hear me talk about that throughout this entire presentation. You hear me also talk about it in other long drawn out dronings. But. Why losing is not something that could be viewed or should be viewed as failure. Individual incremental losses. Do you want to be encouraged? Go to my, uh, I think I titled it, first year result expectations. Like if you want to see what a, a new student, what their trading account is going to look like when they get out there and start really trying to push with real money. I honestly believe over, a, and I'm, I'm saying that would be a, a full year. Now, I condensed a lot of things and did a lot of things with my own experience, but to double your money, which is what you're supposed to be aiming for, if you go back to my original teachings in Baby Pips, when I was on that platform, I said that you should be aiming for 6% a month. If you do that, you'll make 100% return on your equity. That is a phenomenal rate of return. Do not let anybody tell you that that's not a good return. That's fucking sick. That's crazy returns. If you're consistently able to do that and you walk into a institution and say, look, here's my shit. Here's my credentials. They'll put you through a little process, pat you on the back, and then they'll give you a chance. Not everybody, obviously. But if you are proving yourself like that and you got real accounts that you can do that shit, you will be acquired. Because that's a skill set that most people can't do. And you got to do it with low risk. Low risk. How's that done? 30% of your equity, less than 2% risk, but very routine. And you can you can walk into money management, fund management, all those types of things. But you can't just say, hey, look, I went through ICT's mentorship and therefore I know smart money concepts and you people are going to pick me up. They're going to find me. They're going to find nothing. They're not going to find nothing. You got to come there with the receipts. And when you have them, you're going to stand out and they're going to be real interested in what you're doing. And if they consider you, they'll give you a small test, a, a small threshold of here's what you can do to see what you can do with this. And if you do well with that, then they'll allocate more. And then you could be in shit. I, I don't think most people can handle other people's money. That's a, that's a type of risk and stress that, is outside the scope of this conversation. It's way beyond normal stress. Like that's crazy amount of stress. But there's a lot of people that want to do it. And that's one approach where you can. But knowing that the process that you put, you know, I'm putting you through in your training is that you're not going to look at your losing trades as ultimate failure. Whereas when you do have a losing trade, think about what it feels like when you do it wrong. It feels like the whole world's crashing down and you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. You feel embarrassed. You're glad that nobody saw you lose that trade because, and what would they think? What would they say? And what would your response be to what they say about you losing that trade? I told you, so. That's a pipe dream. That shit don't work. SMC concepts are full of shit. <laughs> Listen, if I can come up through all the bullshit that I did, and find these patterns that are very, very, very consistent with my own family members and friends doubting me, telling me everything and every reason why it wouldn't ever materialize. You can do it, but you just got to stop putting all that weight on one transaction or one trading day or one trading week or one trading month. All right. So, and missing trades and the fear of missing opportunities. If you go through this process 
and it's long and arduous and it's boring. It really is boring. But once you get to the pattern of repetition, you will find it's almost like meditation, back testing, studying, logging, tape reading, demoing. You'll get really comfortable with what you're looking for as a pattern. And then when you do have a losing trade, when you have an opportunity that, that fails, that you didn't see come to your outcome that you were hoping for, the targets weren't reached, and the whole idea failed and collapsed. If that occurs, you don't have a fear of missing out on the next trade if you sit still because you know that your trades generally are repeating a lot. They're frequent. But you're not going to have that pattern of a losing trader if you go through this process, because if you don't go through this and this approach to doing it, what are you going to use as experience or a frame of reference? Your gut, your emotions, and what you see other people doing. And that's what young guys do. Young guys like to look at the other crowd out there and whatever grass looks greener, that's where they're going to jump. If they're, if they're system hopping, mentor hopping, um, you know, trying to do what everybody else is trying to do and changing their model because they saw somebody else doing something or which PD array they're going to use because somebody else is out there just doing breakers and I'm making a big to do about fair value gaps now. Um, they're like, oh, I don't, I can't do fair value gaps. So let me go over and do the breaker because I saw this guy, he made $10,000 in his funded account and I saw the withdrawal through. So that's, that's my model. I saw that. No, you're, you're being influenced. That that type stuff. That stuff is social media garbage. It's toxic. It's not going to help you be a better trader. It's actually going to be an impediment. So, unfortunately, that's the reason why a lot of folks come to us and they say, "I'm a cult leader, and this is a cult because I'm trying to give you a mindset that's hive mentality." You have to have. You have to subscribe to one viewpoint in the beginning. You have to, but you graduate and grow from that, and you find yourself. In your own unique model in all the things i'm teaching but if you're coming here and you want to apply a little bit of that and a little bit of this and somebody else's horse shit over here and what you read in a book and what you saw in a video over here or this resembles this and i'm going to try to incorporate you you can't do those things and not be surprised at the results not being what you're hoping for i have a full process here and it's long and it is very studious and it requires a lot of rolled up sleeves and things that are going to take some time from you. And yes, time is a commodity that we don't have more of. When we were putting the tree together, I was dressing it with uh, Caleb and Cameron. And Cameron was uh, bitching about because he wanted to go see his girlfriend. He's like, Dad, how much more do we have put on this tree? <laughs> and I was like, until they're all put on there. I can't reach up there and I get dizzy when I get high up on the, on the ladder. I get vertigo. It's a 12 and a half foot uh, tree, so I had to have my son climb up on this extension ladder that I was so afraid it was going to tear up our wall. But uh, Caleb says to Cameron, he says, instead of belly aching, why don't you just enjoy the time? Because look at that. He's 50 years old. He doesn't have much time left. I'm like, what the fuck? What, what are you talking about? I don't have much fucking time. I'm not, I know I'm 50, but fuck's sake, I'm not a senior citizen. Jesus. <laughs> well, here's what we got here. You're going to have... <laughs> You're going to have this influence of people around you, just like my own kids were influencing each other there. And it influenced me, reminded me. I started thinking, do I got one foot in the grave? For fuck's sake, like, what is this? Like, do they know something I don't know? Like, I'm, I, I'm, I don't move around like I did when I was 20, but man. But that same influence, that factor of influence on social media. I mean, think about it. When you click on tw Twitter, if you're listening to this, you're predominantly coming to Twitter to see what I'm either pointing reference to or maybe I'm sharing a, a, a trade example or, or something. I'm, I'm making a post of some kind and you're waiting for that next dopamine hit. Well, if you're finding yourself chasing that kind of shit on social media about who's hot right now, which system's better, um, I don't have a system. Okay, I don't have a system. Um, I don't have a singular plan outside of what you have been shown on 2022. <clears throat> in my private mentorship, I made 12 extremely, extremely complex and complicated models. And I did that to weed out the assholes 
And I knew they would be sharing it. I knew they'd be pushing it around. Those models make money, but they are so high end and high demanding. Nobody is going to follow them because they are forcing people to do very specific things that they're not going to wait for. But every single one of them make money. And I'm just going to tip my hand and tell you that I have told them in private mentorship that they are to use the 2022 model and to simply replace the PD array that the fair value gap is simply to use the breaker or an order block or a mitigation block or an institutional order flow entry drill. Everything else is the same. That's it. It is not complicated. I complicated it because I knew I had rats in the house with me. Okay. And I smashed a lot of their heads, throwing their asses out. And now we're at the stage where only the real students that are interested in learning how to do it, they're in there, we're engaging on the forum, and there it is. But I will share that and I, I divulge that openly so that way you know. When people are out there trying to say, um, I have ICT mentorship and uh, ICT's opening up his mentorship, or you see people out there pretending to be me saying, I'm opening up my mentorship, I'm not opening up my fucking mentorship. I'm not. I'm mentoring right now. I'm sitting here droning on and on, mentoring you right now, giving you gold. Like I'm giving you the real shit, the real things. This is exactly how I talked to my one-on-ones in the 90s. When I sat with people one-on-one -on -one and trained them individually, this is exactly how I talked to them. I talked to them just like this. I use these same reference points. I've talked about this almost verbatim. The piece of paper I'm holding is the same discolored piece of paper paper from 1996. <laughs> Yes, it looks like it's been uh it's it looks like it's had better days. <laughs> but hey, it's a long time ago, right? But you have to know that social media is toxic and you're trying to keep up with the Joneses and the social media equity curve that everyone's trying to be the person of interest right now. Fuck all that. It's not I, look, I'm growing fast and I don't give a shit. I don't care. I don't care if I don't reach my 1 million subscribers. I would like to. It's just a milestone for me. I just want to do it as a goal. If I don't reach it, I'm not going to cry about it. I'm not going to bellyache. I'm not going to regret or sulk about it. I don't care. But I think if I keep doing what I'm doing, it's going to be the, the result. And that's fine. But journaling is crucial and it's for optimal development. And submitting to that process that we've talked about here, if you have not started a journal, and logging old trade ideas that you didn't participate in and marking them up with great detail of what it is you see in the chart. If you're not revisiting that on the weekends, instead of reading the newspaper or horse shit magazines that you, know, you shouldn't be looking at pornos and stuff like that, all that stuff is a distraction. It's a terrible, terrible waste of time. You need to go back through data, look at old chart moves. Okay. Um, Another thing, if you, if you see that some of my students are sharing their, their examples where they're taking the trades and they're, actually entering the trades and engaging and doing stop losses and targets. That's actually a fruitful thing too, because you're watching other people do what you're learning. So it's not like I'm the only magician here showing a magic trick and performing for you. You can see I have students that are actually able to do these things. So there's logic that works and they are, they're not being told what to do. And I sure as hell I'm not doing sock puppeting. I don't have that shit. I'm not doing that. I don't have time for it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm wrapped up in my own, no shit here. Last thing. Okay. <laughs> we made it. Not really because there's some other shit on the end of this. But uh, know what low-hanging fruit is and target that. Now, what does that mean? You hear probably hear multiple times, you know, low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging objectives and targets. If you're short, okay, what's the closest short-term low. If you're entering on like a five-minute chart, where's your nearest 15-minute low? Where's the hourly low? That's going to be the closest one if the market just keeps dropping. How far away is that? Now, let's let's talk about this because this is a question I saw on, uh, on Twitter where on Forex, I, I have a rule. Like I like 30 pips as a, a Judas swing or less. Generally, it's usually around 20 pips or so in London. If you want to create the high of the day or low of the day, it's going to be a protraction, market to protraction, where it goes the opposite direction you think the market's going to go for that particular day. It's usually 30 pips or less. 
And if it goes beyond 30 pips and goes, it can go to 40. But once it goes over 40, chances are it's probably absolutely not going to be where I think it's going to go. And I have to flip and change my outlook and then look for something else. Maybe not in the same session, maybe later in the day or something like that in like New York session. And the qu question came up like, you know, if you're saying that in terms of pips for Forex, what would be the equivalent in index futures? And I don't really have a, a, a format like that because currencies and the algorithm that runs on those interbank levels, that that's something very specific. And it's a little bit more difficult for me to nail down a specific number of handles. So the, the way we strip that down is I just simply look at the five minute and 15 minute highs and wherever the buy side above that is, I'm looking for it to at least reach there if I'm bearish. Or if it has, say, taken out relative equal highs or a single high on a five or 15 minute chart, and we're now dropping already and it's beginning the morning session, 8.30, or it's crossing over to 9.30 then I'm going to look for a fair value gap. If there's a fair value gap, then I know that the stop run already took place before the opening in New York. So all I'm going to do is look for a fair value gap. And then there it is. It's, it, it started its move early. But if I take that type of trade, regardless of which one I'm using for that given day, they're never going to be the same. You won't see both those instances. It can't be. It, either the relative equal highs, if you're bearish, or the singular 15 or five minute uh, high that has buy side above it, if you're bearish, we are always anticipating that type of scenario where it runs up, knocks out that, scoops up that buy side to pair with shorts and short is the smart money. They're going to look for what? A low. And the low hanging fruit in that example would be the nearest five minute or 15 minute low. Now, if you happen to have a 15 minute or five minute low, that's like maybe five handles or six handles below. I'm not going to consider that. I'm looking for something that has at least 10 handles or more before that's my first objective. Like I'm, that's me. That's my personal, that's not my son's model. My son's models, you know, if he gets five handles, he's done. I'm a little bit more diverse and I, I can look for a little bit more from the market than just simply that clearly. So I'm looking for a low hanging fruit objective would be 10 handles below where I got in at. So I'm measuring, okay, where my entry is. I'm already looking for where I'm going to try to get in at anyway. But if I secure the entry and I'm short, and everything I'm saying here is reversed for going long. So just listen to the logic, write it out on a piece of paper, and then reverse everything directionally, and you'll have the same thing without me saying it the other way. <clears throat> but if you're looking for low-hanging fruit objectives, you can do your entire career with just that. Where your entry is, and if you get 10 handles, Below your entry, that's your low-hanging fruit. Boom, done. Now, if you're going to use what I taught as my son Caleb's model, I made that public. It's out there. It's I think it's in my 2022 mentorship. It's one of those we'd use later in the series or whatever. Then, obviously, you use that model, and that's that low-hanging fruit. You have a static five handles, 20 ticks, and you're done. That's it. You don't care what the rest of the day is going to be. And you start with that and you start with low hanging fruit objectives like that. And it's static. You're not trying to build in the pyramid. You're not trying to turn day trades into position trades. Oh, this is going to be a one shot, one kill. I'm going to hold it for a week. <laughs> no, the path to consistency is doing things over and over and over again that are consistently re resulting in yielding positive results. And the easiest way to build confidence in what you're doing is finding comfort and trust in knowing that enough is enough. 10 handles, 10 handles in the E-mini S&P. It's 500 bucks per contract. So I don't know where you're from, but I don't mind if I got $500 a day. $500, it's pretty good. I average a little bit more net per day in ad revenue on YouTube. It's nice. It's a nice little kitty of money. But something happens when you get in there and you push a button. And because if it starts taking off real quick, you start thinking, oh, it might go down to that other thing that's way down here. 
Because what happens if there's a 50 handle day? What happens if it isn't? And you didn't take your profit and it reverses. <laughs> That's the perspective you're supposed to have. You got to get paid when it gives you the opportunity to get paid. That's why you're here. You're not here for trophies. You're not here for fucking clout. Okay. You're here to make money. That's it. You're not here for friends. You're not here for relationships. You're not here for any kind of attention. You're here to just find some money. That's it. And consistently find an approach that gives you the opportunity to bank that. And you have to do this in your demo account for months to get used to doing that. And over time, what, how much time? Could take years for some of you and maybe less for others. But for a rule of thumb, an approach that can be, in my opinion, replicated by the majority of you, not every one of you. Some of you are just never going to be able to do this, and that's the reality of it. It doesn't mean I'm a failure. It doesn't mean I'm a fraud. It doesn't mean my concepts don't work. It just simply means that you can't do it, and there should be no shame in that. If you ever get to the point where you come to the conclusion that you can't, then okay, no problem. Don't torture yourself anymore. I've had relationships and friends with people that – over the last 30 years, they're not here anymore. They ended themselves. Not because they traded my concepts and they failed, because they did their own thing and they lost. And they lost big and they ended themselves. And I also have friends that did very little in terms of damage to themselves monetarily and they killed themselves for nothing. Nothing. 50 grand. Your whole life is 50 grand. Every one of my vehicles that are paid for it, and I'm not, I'm not leasing, by the way. <laughs> I had the titles, there's no stamps or a lien against any of them. Uh, Vinny, Vinny. The, uh, all of my vehicles cost more than $50,000. And my friend ended himself. $50,000 gone. He's, he's new here. He's not here anymore. Bunch of sleeping pills, and he's resting in peace, I guess. That's how bad it can be if you can't wrestle this stuff beforehand. And you would have never expected that from him. He seemed happy. He seemed chipper all the time. Growing up, we were, you know, the typical. But this kind of stuff, mm -mm. It, it broke him. And he didn't give any sign outwardly. Left a note saying, I lost everything. I can't, I can't do it. That sucks. Because you can't say anything to him anymore. You can't encourage him. You can't float him alone and say, hey, look, I'll, I'll find you to get you back. And there's a lot of you that listen to me. And I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what you've done, what kind of harm you can have to yourself. But I try to do everything I can I try to do everything I can to keep these types of things from occurring again. And one of the fears I have is, say I do meet an untimely end, okay? The Lord calls me home and that's his business and I'm ready when he wants to do it. But if my kids don't know how to do this like I want them to know it, I would not want them to feel that kind of pressure. I wouldn't want them to have that level of pressure on them that they feel like it's too much, it's overwhelming. So growing up, uh, I pushed a lot for them to want to do what I do, but I didn't push so hard that they would feel like they have to do that. So that's why I drove them into working. That way it wasn't me twisting their arm like a dad saying, go to my alma mater, go to my college. 
and, and try to live vicariously through my kids. I am dying to live vicariously through my kids as a trader. I want to see them doing well and me grow older, watching them do, you know, wild exploits and, and conquering things and taking down huge windfall victories and things. I want to see that. Not just in one kid. I want all my children to do that, but it might be unrealistic expectation for me. It's clearly not going to happen with my daughter, at least for right now it hasn't. <clears throat> but I forced them into having jobs, thinking that that would be better for them. And when I was raising them, I got in arguments with people online that would say, oh, you know, because I told myself, look, I'm setting them up. They ain't going to do any of that stuff. And a guy sends me an email or rips into me and says, you know, you're doing the worst thing you can do, and blah, blah, blah. I think I've said this before. Matter of fact, I know I have. But uh, I started seeing some of those things manifest in Cody. And it made me change my approach with the other ones. And I make, I make them work. They don't have to work, but I make them work. And they've had issues with you know, having anger towards me because why don't you just do this for me? And why don't you just you know give me this and give me that? And there's been a few times where I've almost buckled and said, you know what, I just want to make it easier for them. That's the worst thing I could have done. They're, they're having the greatest life lesson right now, working their jobs. They don't make a lot of money. I mean, Caleb makes about $1,100 a week warehousing. And he's doing his little thing with his uh, trading development. He's not in a hurry to be a millionaire. He's interested in getting comfortable with talking in front of all of you. He wants to do a YouTube channel. He's like, man, that'd be nice if I could get a YouTube channel like yours, Dad. And I'm going to actively promote him. And I will be on his shit <laughs> periodically to build his base up. But it's it's to me, it's encouraging to, to see at least one of my kids because I think crypto has messed up Cody. Like, it, it, I think it's left a bad taste in his mouth. I mean, we talked last week or whatever. And he, and he was like, I said, I said, why don't you just simply focus on index futures? Don't do Forex. Don't do anything else. Don't touch crypto anymore. I'll spot you a little bit of cash to get you started. And then we'll work together. And I'll, I'll just show you what you need to be focusing on. Use what I laid out for Kirsten. And then there it is. You do that, everything will be fine. And don't try to do more than it's necessary. But he suffers from a lot of anxiety. And he treats it with the uh, marijuana, which I don't like that smoking aspect of it. But I don't have anything against edibles. I don't have anything against uh, the oils, the tinctures. Uh, that, that benefited me. So I have nothing against it. I used to be a big opponent. We had arguments and I was angry with him for a long time. But I think that... Uh, for him to do this, he would have to stop doing it, at least when he trades, because he gets a little bit more paranoid when he's using it. But he does it, to, you know, in his mind, he's doing it to, to calm himself down. But you're going to have what when you're trading? Anxiety, right? You push a button, and there's money to be made or lost. You're going to be thinking about that while you're in it. And if you amplify that with something that's already going to increase the level of paranoia, like cannabis could, and not in everybody. Like when I was using it for my back, man, I was comfortable. It allowed me not to feel like every racing thought had to be in the front of my mind first, which is what it always is. And living with bipolar, it's, it's very hard, very hard to manage everything that I'm thinking at the time and all these different potential topics that I know that would be interesting to me. And I can go and start them and continue others and come back to the other one, and it, it's not a problem for me, but people outside listening, it's just, it's very hard to, to track, and that makes it hard for listeners, for me, or to have retention in, in listenership. But if he's going to be developing himself as a student and, and trading, you know, not crypto, because he was trying to do the investing, the hold on for dear life shit. He bought into all that nonsense, all the celebrities saying they're doing it too. All waiting for that 2017 meteoric rise in Bitcoin again and made really poor choices. 
So he doesn't have, he does not have any skill set whatsoever, except for having invested a little bit, a little bit of money profitable just for a little while. And then he's in Ada way underwater. And he's in another couple shit coins that are way underwater. And he's all tied up with that Coinbase bullshit where he can't even get his money out. So it's a mess. And he took a loan out, 20 grand on a credit card. <laughs> wanted to prove me wrong. And I know there's a lot of you out there that are trying to prove me wrong, that are not trying to be my students. You just want to prove me wrong. I'm inviting you to prove me wrong. I've always invited that. Go through my stuff with the intent to say it does not work. There's no validity in it. It does not work. If you do that, go in with that. I've had so many students that actually came into my fold with that very approach. They were tired of hearing me talk this shit. Showing examples that everybody wants to claim is cherry picked. And they want to go in through it and just say, hey, it is. And they're like, man, I, I saw it. It was there. And they used to be major trolls. Now they're part of the fold. They're part of the cult. The cult of winning. ASMR. ICT. You like this? <laughs> Stop whispering. You're creeping me out, ICT. <laughs> so I thought I would talk about Robins a little bit here. And uh, I gave you an example of like, if you can turn one contract, one contract, okay? If you build a model that you make 100% in five weeks. Now, I'm not saying that new students should try to aspire to this, but there's a lot of you that are very well-versed in my stuff and been doing really, very well. And some of you are actually talking about going in the Robins Cup next year. And I'm excited for it. I'm absolutely excited to see it. But let's talk about different approaches about winning Robin's Cup. I'm going to give you a couple of recipes here, okay? So that way you can think about how this might be impactful for you and how if you want to use it for another competition like FTMO um, or anything. You know, go out there and these people that are beating their chest saying they're the best and they have the shit that doesn't stink. Uh, you, you can go out there and rip the shit off and destroy them. You do a lot of what I've already said here. In terms of the mindset and limiting your exposure okay everybody else out there is good looking for the maximum leverage what they can use i need to be able to use a discount broker because i can trade with 300 percent margin and i'm gonna really not look good if i go out there in front of everybody and i only make 100 percent for the year well first of all even if someone lost to me and they had 100 percent return you know what i'm gonna say that's 100 percent fucking earned that's good that's fucking good in anybody's book. And, and, and not in terms of anybody, but I mean, there's a lot of people that say that's not enough. But 100% is easy in the hands of someone that knows how to trade. And in a gambler's eyes, they think, well, I can get 100% over leveraging, you know, just a couple couple days or a week or so. And I can, I can double that. Yeah, that's nothing. That to me is not trading. That's gambling. This is the number one reason why I say all the time, Robin's Cup. And you see the same belly aching excuses. Oh, Robin's is a shit broker. Oh, it's a shit platform. It's a, you know what they're doing? They're making excuses why they fucking suck as a trader. Because if you can't make money with one contract, you can't trade. Period. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry can get on a fucking simulated account or a live account and push the maximum leverage and get lucky. Get lucky on a short span of time. And make a windfall victory and beat that shit like they've been doing it for 20 years. That's not consistency. And that's not trading effectively. And most of the time it's done without even using a stop loss. So how can you argue that that's good trading? That's not good trading. Trading is where you're managing risk, you're managing drawdown, and you're consistently profitable. That's the number one reason why I always bark and say that Robbins is the place I will compete against anybody and I will fucking destroy anyone. The invitation is open. You know somebody that's a big wheel? Get them to go in there. I will go in there because I don't think Robbins is going to be a match for fucking Vinny. He can't do one contract. He has to get his shit with multiple simulated contracts or 
Maybe he's doing it with the live account and he has the benefit of $300 margin and $500 margin. You don't have that, that crutch that saves your ass and you gamble your way out of it. No, 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 no. You're going to fucking trade. You're going to, you're going to rely on precision and consistency and you don't have it. 15 years you've been trading and you only talk about a year and a half and it's like a little bit over hundred percent. That's your track record. Where's the other years? Where's this year? Where's 21? Where, where's all that shit? I don't need you to provide that for me. I want you to get in that Robin's cup and I will give you a track record that your fucking head will spin on. All you gotta do is get on there and place one time. Just climb up there like Tom Dante did and failed at five spot. I'll know you're in there, but you gotta show your full account number because I heard you, I got it recorded. You're gonna go in there and use multiple accounts because we've already seen you shit yourself in the last week, three times. And you deleted the fucking streams. I got them recorded. I got you recorded saying that you're going to beat Larry Williams' record this year, whether I get in there or not. I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm fucking here for it. But for the students of mine that want to win this bitch, number one, you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot to do it. Okay. Every single time in the past few years, okay. I have had some joker, some clown come to me, okay, and claim that they're going to join the Robins Cup. They, some of them do the registration, and they show that they're registered. Great. I went and did the same thing I registered. Now, registering is not the same as opening up an account. So I have not had money in Robins Cup in all the years that Vinny and other people claim I have. Now, I did register to retort to those individuals that said they were going to step up and do it. But they never did it. They never joined. They never funded an account. And they never placed. And I used to have, you have to be on the leader one spot. And then I'm not going to waste my time with anybody else that's not going to do that. Because if you're a trader and you really are going to make an effort to do this for the full year, you'll get your ass up there. I'm not holding that as a requirement now. But you got to get on that board. Because I've had people say, show you have Corvettes and I'll delete my videos about your bullshit. If you do this, I'll stop everything I've said about you and all the lies and horseshit you've done. I'm not buying into that now. No, 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 no. You said you're in it. You're going to prove it by logging in, showing your account number. And that better be the fucking account number that you supposedly are going to win with. Now, let's talk about some recipes. How to win a World Cup. How to win a competition. How to rip the shit off of everybody else out there. You ready? You don't use Algo Box. <laughs> you don't use that. You use simple fucking logic and you use simple stop loss orders. You have to use a stop loss every single time. Okay. Now think about this. If you looked at what Larry Williams did and you studied his, his statements and such, which I did for years as a 20 some year old, um, I didn't have the access to seeing his statements. I didn't see them really until I was in my early thirties. And I don't know if they were available prior to that, but when I was in my early 30s, that's the first time I sat down. I've literally walked through every single one of his trades, and I was like, okay, well, I mean, clearly, he's being honest. He's talking about how he's not a good trader. He used the benefit of maximized money management, and when his winners were winning, they were crazy, crazy payouts, and when they were when his losses were happening, it was a big loss, but he was okay with taking that kind of loss because he knew his system, his approach was meant to capture big range days. And if he was going to trade a day when he thought a big range days was going to come, whether it be an up day or down day, he knew that if he got stopped out before the day before, the, the, the bigger day would come and it would eat up that loss because it would be many times less than a full daily range would be. So with all that said, and without making it even more boring than it already is, I got to thinking like, okay, so how can I do this multiple ways where I can get to 11,000%? And one of the, well, I did it two times on Twitter. I ran up two different demo accounts. One, I did a $5,000 account and another one did 100,000. And I've never claimed that was a live account. I've never done that at all. The, the screenshots that you see, Vinny and other assholes out there doing, uh, there was one live account. I actually still have the account. I still have it. It was the residual uh, account that when FXCM got sued and got thrown out of the United States, um, I had an account that I was letting my son, 
underage, not allowed to trade with, but I've done that before with GFT. <laughs> uh, the uh, that account, I think I had like two hundred dollars or whatever in it, and I was making them trade with really, really small leverage to try to try to learn it and try to get interested in doing it. And it was back when Adam Webb was, you know, trying to get me doxxed. He wasn't trying to have a real competition with me, but he wanted me to provide me provide him rather my personal information because you know he's a piece of shit. But I proved that the only account that I showed, was demo and the only thing that I showed ever with a live was a two hundred dollar account. And when I scrolled back to prove that there was no trading done in it, well, I scrolled all the way back. And when FXCM was thrown out of the United States and Forex.com purchased all the accounts and acquired all the accounts, there was a rollover from that brokerage firm to this brokerage firm. So when they did that, they deposited a million dollars of fake money in the account and then withdrew it. And that I even asked them, I, I, I literally got into a discussion on there and recorded myself saying, hey, you know, what's the what's the deal? Why does that look like that? And Adam Webb said, oh yeah, you're, you're using an MT4 rented MT4 server because you're putting a million dollars in and taking it out. I said, I, I'm not claiming that is a million dollar withdrawal. I'm showing you that that is how they started the account. And if you email, email forex.com. If you, don't, if you think that I'm talking shit, you email and contact Forex.com and ask them, when you guys did the FXCM buyout where all the American accounts that were in that brokerage firm rolled over into Forex.com, how does the account get started? Because if I scroll back way before Forex.com acquired the account, how is it able to show two years before that a million-dollar deposit and a million-dollar withdrawal in the same time? That was the way that their system, their server, initiated the uh, the identification of that account. That's all that was. And, and to prove that that was the only account that I had that would be made public, I was toying and, and joking with these assholes. I swiped over and showed it's a live account. I showed it was a Forex.com live account, and it showed the live server, and I showed the account number. Now, what these dickheads do is they take that, they splice that little piece there, and they say, I said that big run up twice in the million dollar accounts when i was demo it was all demo i've never shown any live trading ever ever in a live account i called myself the demo baller i did that and i fucked with everybody and nobody could even come close to what i was doing period and i grew on demo only only people watched everything that i did on youtube that's why they subscribed they never heard me fucking say, I did this shit with live funds. That's never fucking happened. And every person that logged into my mentorship, they signed an agreement, knew and everything they were learning was all demo. They're learning price action. They're not even they're not even learning trading. Just like you're not learning trading, you're learning price action. So that's a really real shit. That's the market historian shit that you don't get to know about. And they can all be fucking factually checked by simply reaching out to forex.com and you'll see it done but how do you win the robin's cup oh ict you're all over the place but you keep coming back <laughs> so i started thinking to myself okay how can i do this systematically where running up eleven thousand percent but i don't want to do the full year because i don't like december because i want to have the holidays off like you see me enjoying it now i'm not making youtube videos but i'm having a whole lot of fun on twitter but and you're learning so don't complain Okay, there's no refunds here. The bottom line is this. If you can find a way that systematically has a process of seeing setups that form continuously, okay, just think for a second, because this is the big disconnect that everybody has about competing and you know trading and doing both sides of the fucking market trading. If you know the bias, and I've already told you how to map out the year in this whole presentation here today. If this idea of everything I've mapped out resonates with you, I want you to sit down in your charts and think about what happens. What happens if you can get six handles a day? That's easy. Do three in the morning, three in the afternoon. You don't even have to have a full pool. What does that mean? 
get in your entry, and go to your full terminus target. Three handles is shit. It's nothing. Like, that's nothing. That's nothing. Like, I could literally almost close my eyes and throw a fucking dart at a wall and put stickers all over the wall and have yes, buy, yes, sell. And whatever I hit on it, I can still get three handles out of that, just by static price action alone. It sounds unbelievable, but it really is that easy. Three handles is nothing. It's just static price action alone. You can get that. Now, if you know when it's likely to have the order flow in one direction, aiming for a particular high or low intraday, and you're going in and you're trying to get three handles in the morning, three handles in the afternoon, you have a recipe that you consistently aim just for that. You're not trying to get the full range. You're not trying to get 10 handles. All you got to do is simply do that. And let money management do the heavy lifting. If you average 11% a week, which I know some of you are like, what the fuck? 11%? Mike, come on. Michael, come on. 11%? That's, that, that's, that's a lot. Actually, it's not. If you're in, number one, if you're competing and you have a system that has lots of setups, I have lots of setups. I have a repertoire and an arsenal that is absolutely unmatched. I have shit that nobody's ever seen before. I'm going to share some of that next year. But you only need a small little piece every single day. And here's what fucks up everybody. They all want to rush to the high end of that leaderboard and stay there and taunt everybody. They, they want to get to a safe high ground. And they all want to get there real, real quick. That's the built-in advantage. You got to play the long game. The long game is taking small little pieces even on one contract, and let it build up each time. Each time, build it up, build it up. And when you get your three, you stop. Wait till the next session. Get your three, stop. Close the fucking shit down. Don't trade anymore. Everybody else is going to be pushing. They're going to be buying and selling the same day because they think their fucking system doesn't does amazing things, and they end up fucking drawing down. Everybody does that. Everyone loses their ass that way. Don't be like them. Know what you're looking for, aim for it, hit it, walk. Done. You ever see the movie 21? I love that. I love that movie. It's it's classic to me. I look at that as how a trader listens to the analyst. They had a they had a process. They go in, they have a system, they're counting cards, they know what they're looking for. When the table goes cold, they gotta get up. They gotta get the fuck up because the probabilities have done what? They shifted. You're not likely to get a good run. Get up. Well, when you get your shit, you stop. So three handles in the morning, three handles in the afternoon, or if you're capable, six handles in the morning and you're done. And just do all the heavy lifting with the money management. A more skillful way of doing it would be aiming for 12.5% per week. It's like 60% a month compounding over and over and over again. And you can have it done in, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think 10, three quarters of a month, like a little less than 11 months. But you have to have the discipline to stop. You have to stop. And if you have a losing trade, stop. Don't go in again. You can't use, I got to fix it. You can't, you can't fix a flat. Okay. <laughs> you just eat that and go home. Everybody else is going to be rushing. They're all going to be rushing to get out there and try to make a big, huge splash like Mr. Kevin Stufflebean. And he did. I was impressed. I was like, man, this guy came out the gate. Look at this shit. <clears throat> Up there, 1,300%. I was like, this guy's going to fucking do great. But then his first losing trade that I was able to you know, really pay attention to when I was really tracking it. Dude, you lost like 400%. Like, that's a lot. That's a big hit. And then when that hits, you want to do what? Got to get it back. But you just don't make it back with 400%. You got to make more than 400% to get that back. See, that's the problem. With you. When you go into drawdown in your competition, drawdown in competition is exponentially higher than just simply trading for income. So there's a whole different paradigm shift that needs to take place. And 
claiming you won four fucking competitions when nobody was really aware of those competitions, that's kind of bullshit. And you didn't really compete against people that are really doing it. If you're looking at Robin's Cup, there's a lot of names that keep showing up each year. Man, I got respect for that. These people, they're not talkers, they're doers. You don't see them out there beating their chest. They sometimes sell shit, but guess what? I think they earned it. Robert Miner. I've never talked to the guy. I've never met the guy. He's up there a couple times. I haven't seen him this year, but you know, I've seen his name up there multiple times. Many, many, many times uh, I've seen his, and he didn't place in the top five in the end of some of the years, but I did see him get up there. I got respect for that man. He's doing it. Like he's literally doing it. I don't know how he trades. I never looked into it, but I know he does some kind of education. But there's other, there's another guy out there that's, I think he's done it uh, four times. He's doing ads now on YouTube saying that he's the only four time winner of the Robins Cup. Um, that's cool. You know, that's great. I know he's selling a course or whatever. And I got no problem. It, you proved it, you've done it. But if you find a way to simply look for one and a half, to two and a half percent each trading day. Now that's a lot for a new trader, but I'm talking to the folks that's been around the block for a while and you know your model, you've been doing well. How many times have you ever sat down and thought, this is all I need to do and stop? Forget how far it can run. Forget all that. Forget doing buying and selling in the same day. Forget all that. Strip it down to the brass tax. And unfortunately, in competition, you're going to be using 2% risk. It's not a lot, but that 2%, it adds up quick. If you're taking low-hanging fruit, systematically targeting it, boom, getting out. Boom, getting out. You can do it with one contract. And it becomes two contracts. Slow, but it gets you there. Now, think about it like this. $10,000 is the minimum requirement to get into the futures division, right? $10,000. Folks, we're just talking math right now, okay? It's just math. If you need to make 12.5% a week, what does that translate? What does that translate into? $1,250 end of week. That's your goal. Now take that $1,250 and divide that up over five trading days. What do you have to make each day? 250 bucks. Divide that in half on two sessions. What do you have to make? $125. But, but ICT, I might not be able to have the margin to do one full contract of the S&P. You don't need to. You can trade currency futures, bond futures. See, you have to have an arsenal, a repertoire, a bond system that nobody can fucking touch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. I have shit that fucking Iron Man would want to buy from me. Stark Enterprises ain't got shit on ICT. But strip it down, down to the chrome. What do you have to do? 125 bucks the first week, each session, or $250 each day. Or, if you're a swing trader, get two trades aiming for $675 each. You break it down modularly, bite-sized pieces. And when you hit it, you stop. Everybody else is always full bore. Push, 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 push. You got to be the master of the long game. Let them break themselves, and they will. They're all going to want to try to be the best real quick, fast name on the, on the leaderboard. They all Every year they do this, every single year. And the person that always gets up there first never fucking finishes. In fact, many times, the very first five people, watch what happens in January when they first start posting it. Do it. Keep track of it. The same first five people, you never see them again. You never see them again. It's usually around, I don't know, April. That's when you start seeing a consistent, okay, these are the same faces we're seeing. They just rotate in and out which spot they're in. Sometimes they'll fall off the board and come back on. 
with crazy drops and, and increases, which means they're doing what? They're gambling. They're not good traders. They're gambling, which in many aspects, one can argue and say that's what Larry Williams did. And I guess in, in a certain way, yes, that's true because he admits in his own words that he's not a good trader and he relied heavily on money management. And I know he's never done it again. I would have liked to seen him do it again in the Robins Cup, but he's done it in his other accounts, you know, outward outside of the competition. And I don't give a shit, you know, it doesn't have to be in a Robins Cup if you've done it there once, you know, you've done it. But <clears throat> if you get 12 and a half or if you do 11, if you do 11 percent each week, you got to do less than two hundred fifty dollars a day. And what happens in the second week? Is it much more that you have to do? Nope. Nope. Just, just simply do a spreadsheet and do the math on it. What you have to do each day, break it down, and you'll see it's been there the whole time. All these fucking barkers, these people out there talking their shit. Oh, yeah, I'm going to join it with you. Dude, it's so easy to do it. Do it. Join it with me. I will love fucking smoking your ass. <laughs> I'm going to do a whole lot more than this, but I'm giving you a recipe to go ahead and do it. You want to try to beat Larry Wayne's recipe? Or not recipe, but his, his results. I mean, it's a fucking great number, 11,000%. That's a lot. But here's what's going to happen. You jokers that have never handled real money, as soon as you start crossing, if you can get this far, as soon as you cross six figures, 200,000 if you get that far, we're talking about numbers you probably have never handled before. And you'll get reckless, and the losses will feel like mountains laying on top of you and paralysis will kick in fear performance anxiety all that kicks in because now they see your name on the board and you got to stay there or what would they think all that shit that forces a trader to trade and follow the logic of sound money management and controlling themselves and those that can't fall to the wayside that's how you measure a trader not some bullshit over leverage no stop loss discount broker shit i don't and i'm not impressed by that i've never been impressed by that i've done it in my own life and it's not impressive i wasn't impressed when i was able to do that i'm like it was fucking stressful i'm glad i got through that but if we're going to talk about comp competition and trading we're going to go to a real arena Use industry standard margins where everybody has the equal playing field and you cannot YOLO. Can't do it. And now for the Forex division, you only got to do 25 pips a week. Everything I gave you when I was on baby pips. What? Yeah. Do the math. <laughs> do, do, do the math. It's all there. See, you've complicated all this shit and looked at things, looking at indicators, what indicator setting, which tool I use here, you know, all this shit. It's all math. That's all it is. If you have a cookie cutter and that's what you're doing with your model, your model is your cookie cutter. What you're going to do every single time, okay, as long as you have dough, that's your money, you're going to press that cookie cutter into the dough. And when you lift that cookie cutter up, what are you taking out of it? A cookie cutter shaped amount of dough. Each time you're doing the same fucking thing. You're not trying to get a Santa cookie cutter, pressing it down and waiting for it to come out in the shape of a present or a candy cane. No, you're expecting the same result each time. You're not trying to demand that cookie cutter does anything other than what it's shaped to do. Think, folks, think, think. How many times has your ideas morphed once you press the button? You change your opinion about where it's going to go, how far it's going to go. It might not get there. That's a proof and sign that you have traded before you're ready. They're all corrected by doing whatever I taught you in the beginning of this presentation and other lessons too. It's not important for you to win competitions. But I know some of you young men want to do it. The 
interest in wanting to do it. I'm interested in watching. I'm interested in seeing it. I want to see it. Like, I really want to see it. Like, I love watching other people trade. I love it. I love watching what they go through. And if they're able to you know, more or less articulate what they're feeling, I love that. Because I'm a person that, like, if I read a book, I'm in that book. If I watch a movie, I'm in that movie. And like Caleb, one of the things that him and my youngest son, they had this thing with them. They want to talk during a fucking movie. <laughs> okay. And that breaks the illusion. Like, I'm in there. What are you doing? I'm, 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 out here. I'm here. I'm saving the fucking world. And you're here talking to me now. I'm back in the, uh, in the movie room here. What are we doing? You got to shut up and let me be in this, this moment. Well, when you're trading, like you have to be completely immersed in that and filter out all the distractions, all the bullshit. And if you think for a moment you're going to be able to do well and be part of the community in social media or flexing and doing this, it, it doesn't work like that. It does not work like that because you're going to carry that stimuli back into your next trade. And whether it was support by people that love you or from people that are trying to see you fail, it's all going to have an impact on you. And you're going to be thinking about that as a factor in what your next trade results going to be versus I have my cookie cutter. I'm pushing it into the marketplace and I'm going to retract the amount of dough that it's designed to take out. And you have to be systematic about it. And it has to be very, very low end, easy to get. Not this monumental 20 handle day. I got to do that or I, you know, I'm not going to win. That's bullshit. You don't need a lot. You just need time and consistency and let the money management do the heavy lifting. And you got to be prepared to slowly see the equity curve go up. It'll still be going up fast. Not in the beginning. It'll look like nothing's going on. It'll be, it'll be other people are going to shoot by you because they're over leveraging. Your first week it may not be 11 or 12 and a half percent. It might be just 10% or maybe 8%. Who cares? Or maybe it's 5%. Who cares? The long game, that's what you're playing. And you're going to let that pan out. And you're going to work on one side of the marketplace. You're not going to you're not going to do both sides. You're going to trade in your bias. That's it. Where's the order flow? That's it. And you're stopping. Every person that's going out there trying to get every possible trade, they are fooling themselves. They're trying to, to trick their mind into thinking that more is better. And what happens if they do get that big payout or that big windfall? Okay, but what's the chances of that really happening? Remember, you're in a competition. Everything's going to be squeezing and pressuring and just, it's going to be a lot. You might think you're ready right now, but if you don't control your perspective, and control your emotions and remember what you're doing and all the little bit that you have to do and control your frequency of trade, you'll blow it. And you'll start doing things that are reckless. You'll abandon the approach. You'll abandon your model. You'll, you'll just do dumb things trying to get back when you have all those other months to do that very thing. And everybody else is going to break themselves on the rocks of trying to climb up that mountain. It only matters if you're there at the top at the last day of that competition that's it that's it you gain some ground in the first half of the year sit still let everybody fuck up in the summer and in the fall you use what i talked about here and you milk it and you just roll around in there will you beat larry williams record <laughs> probably not but do you have a chance of placing on the top five absolutely Absolutely. And if you get to the point of number two, and I think if I'm not mistaken, I think it's like 1300, just call it 1400%. If you do 1400%, sit still. Chances are you're not going to see anybody come near you because they have to work with the same leverage you're doing. If they have a bigger account, that means they have to work even harder to get that bigger account percentage wise to grow too. So there's all kinds of built-in disadvantages for gamblers, which is why I love it. I love it because it makes it real. I don't give a flying fuck how many over-leveraged contracts or fucking lots you want to do in your horse shit. 
Okay. I don't care about that. I'm an offshore broker. I made this much money, but who gives a fuck? That's not trading. That's gambling. And you're missing the whole entire point. I am convinced, and this is the part where it's going to sound like ego, but it's just the fucking facts. I am convinced there is not a person alive on this fucking planet that can outperform me in precision or in consistency in trading. There it is. I've said it, and I've invited all of you in the earshot of this fucking video or stream, whatever you want to call it, and you've heard me all say this before. Step. And let's show the world. You're going to fail. <laughs> you're going to fail if you're trying to beat me. That's a, that's, that's a given. But I want to see you try. That's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. It's admirable. Don't be a Sam. Don't disconnect your MyFX book because you're blown out. And still talk shit about me. Okay, don't do that. Make a real attempt. Really register. Show your account number, what you're working with, and let's roll. You got a whole year to play. And I'll let every bit of my results do all the talking. I won't even be mean to you. But I'm going to ragdoll your fucking ass. <laughs> oh, I'm going to fucking destroy your ass. All you got to do is come to the dance. That's all you got to do, baby. And I'll take the lead. I'll show you shuffles you ain't never seen before. But that's what I had on my mind today. Woke up this morning and I was thinking to myself, you know what? I got one more in the tank. <laughs> I got one more, one more last Twitter space. So there's there's lots of ways to skin that cat. And you might not be wanting to really join the Robins Cup, but you're thinking, well, I could just do that and try to build my account up that way. And what happens if you just used 1% risk and use that same model of low-hanging fruit, consistently get your pound of flesh and stop and go home for the day. Don't do anymore. If you go back and look at your trading, you probably would have done very well if you would have simply just did that. And pushing it all the time, doing more trades than that's necessary, trying to look good in front of other people. How many trades did you see me do yesterday? How many the day before? How about on Wednesday? I'm looking for one good setup that's going to yield me more than I'm aiming for, and that's how I know I can trust it. <sighs> Hear that? I'm looking for a trade setup that's going to potentially yield more than I'm looking for. My low-hanging fruit, my objective, is going to be within the thresholds of what I believe the market's really going to go for. That's what makes me consistent. That's what made my analysis consistent in front of the eyes of everybody in my mentorship for years, not just once in a while, for years. Every single day I sat down with them. Every single day I co-signed what I thought the market was going to do. And 90% and a fucking person, one in my mentorship can say otherwise because it's all proof. It's all there. They saw it. They witnessed it. And I've invited all of them to come out here publicly many times and said, if I was not that way, you call me bullshit right now. And they'd be an army of motherfuckers coming out here. This is not what happened. You don't see that happening. And you can get there too, but you get there with what I just outlined in this discussion. And this is the same conversation I had every single time with the exception of Robin's Cup stuff. But I had the same exact verbatim outline that I sat with a new one-on-one -on -one student. This was our first session. This is what we, we, we went through this. Usually we went to go get something to eat, you know, something light, you know, like a brunch or something. And I would, over a drink, not alcoholic, obviously, but uh, we'd sit there and I would give this outlook and say, look, this is this is what you're getting into. Like this is this is it. After this, you know, you're stuck with the commitment. But if you want to back out, this is when you do it. And I had people say, you know, it sounds too much. I, I don't really think I can do it. No problem. I enjoyed meeting you, and there it was. But the ones that continued, they went through basically what 
a lot of the mentorship stuff was. But you, they didn't have a whole year with me. Like, I condensed a lot of shit. And there it was. At the time, I had some things that I would be willing to share on Trade Station, and I don't do that anymore. No, I'm not selling it. No, I'm not making it available to you and never promised it to anyone. So there it is. But we're talking and we're having conversations, so there it is. But the things that I do, you know, I, I'm not making them automated for everyone to use. I mean, look at what they've done with my stuff already. They've already abused it and prostituted it. And, you know, no, <laughs> no. And there's a lot of guys out there that are coding my stuff and making you know, tools with it on TradingView. And that's cool. I ain't got no problem with it. One guy tweeted to me and said, hey, look, I'm, I'm automating some of your shit. You got a problem? Just let me know. I, you know, I'll, I'll make good on it. No, I don't have a problem with it. I, I don't care. I, what I gave out this year, I wanted everybody to taste it. Taste and see, and you'll see. You'll experience it yourself. If it doesn't work, if it's full of shit, you'll know. But if it works, you're going to know. <laughs> and I've had so much fun this year. Like, I've had so much fun. I don't want it to end. That's why I keep coming back. <laughs> now, obviously, my wife, she's tied up with my other son today. But uh, if she wasn't, I wouldn't be able to do this. I just wanted to sit down with you one more time. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to say I don't have an opportunity probably between now and the first of the year because I probably might because she wants to do something that's going to be requiring her to leave the house. And if that's the case, I might, get, might have one more in me, but I don't think I'll have one this long and this wide scope and, and different topics and such. But if you use this as a foundation, what you're supposed to be focusing on how to go back to the basics that's what this is it kind of helps you realign yourself so if you've lost your way you, you, you got into the core content after you found what you wanted to find in the 2022 mentorship model and you went into the core content stuff and now you're like man i got all these things on my head now i'm confused which is what i told you if you know what you're doing with the model in 2022 mentorship don't go on the core content you don't need it i just put it there to keep the scammers from selling it that's all i put it there for that's it so is it useful? I believe so. But you don't need it because all those lessons lead to a model like 2022. It ends with that as a result. And there isn't a whole lot of moving parts to it, is it? It's pretty straightforward. It's simple. And some of you are like, what the fuck? I just learned all this shit and all these videos, all these other series that you did. And you just come out here and drop. I've had literally people mad in the mentorship like you could have just did that and save me all the time no you could not have learned that in such a short time had you not because there's people that have gone through the mentorship on 2022 and still can't figure it out only the ones that have been with me for a little while it's clicked for them and you don't get that you don't understand that all those other lessons helped you get to exactly where you are right now don't foolishly think that it was going to be that easy for me to make it easy for all you to understand because you've struggled with other things, other factors in the lessons I've taught, just like many of the private mentorship students did. The ones that weren't profitable, the ones that aren't consistent yet, they're floundering around or trying to figure out what they're supposed to be looking for. Many times they're doing things that I've talked about in this presentation, chasing different things because they saw other people doing it or even me doing it. Oh, well, let me just do that then. Oh, he made money over there. Let me try to do that now. Oh, he's using that market. Let me trade that now. What the fuck? You got to stop. Like this works in everything. I'm not co-signing crypto, but it works in everything else. Stocks, futures, Forex. It's, it's all there. It repeats. So you want to be in markets that are very, very precise. And professionals really trade the indices. And you can see the precision is still there. And the only reason why I left it, folks, listen, the only reason why I left this was when Forex was moving wildly. Like the volatility in Forex was in, insane. It was huge, huge ranges. So shit, <laughs> I'm going there. It wasn't all good. 
but I had a lot of fun trading it when it was hot. And now because of the, the risks and things I think that are coming for like all the central bank digital currencies, that's going to have, that's going to be a heavy weight for Forex. And we're, we're witnessing the end of it, whether you want to admit it or not. Okay. In your lifetime, you're going to see the end of Forex. You're going to see it. It's absolutely going to happen. And I don't give a fuck. Who's saying otherwise? They can laugh and troll and make all the jokes they want. All you have to do is use a little bit of common sense. Because if the central banks are introducing their own central bank digital currency, that means that they're trying to wrangle in control of money. And you can't buy or sell any of that shit that you want to spend. Like you can go out with cash and buy yourself a firearm. You can go out there and buy groceries. You can go buy a boat. You can buy everything. It's really not tracked. So, oh, I guess a firearm is, but most things aren't. You can go out and buy illicit drugs. I'm not saying you should, <laughs> but you can do that with cash right now. You will not be able to do that when everybody's on their central bank digital currency. So once they wrangle everybody's money and the control thereof, the next step is, all right, now we got it on digital. Everything is controlled. You can't do anything. And now it's something they can control the buying prior, the power of, like they have in China, where you know, they have a, a COVID passport and you can't leave your house if it's this and that. You can't buy anything. You can't do that. That's what's coming everywhere. And you can't see that coming. Like, look around. That's what they're doing. That's exactly what's coming. And once everybody's underneath that, we're going to roll to one currency. Everything's you know, becoming one global thing. And it's going to be one global constitution or rule of law. And it's going to be ugly as shit. And they're already preparing. There. They're already saying, look, you get ready for all this kind of stuff. And you're out here wanting to trade Forex. Big risk. I'm not. I'm not. Because any moment, the penny can drop. And shit can go upside down real quick. Just like the euro and the Swiss ED pegging. And I'm sorry. I am not. I, I got Billy Badass balls. Okay, I do. I just know that kind of shit would wreck me. Like, bad. And I don't think I could come back from that. Because I know I shouldn't do it right now. And if I stay in it and push and push and push. And besides, the, the, the volatility isn't all that great. It's better in index futures. It's cleaner action right now, and it's predictable. And for anybody that would argue and say, no, 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 I can't, I can't trade that. I want to stay in Forex. Well, you can still trade if you're outside the U.S. You can trade the U.S. 30, U.S. 100, and U.S. 500. They're very close. They're not identical. They're not identical or mark to market, obviously, like the futures markets in the U.S. But they're very close, and they're tradable. I can't trade them in the U.S., but people outside the U.S. can. And some of you had the benefit of being able to do it, you know, with uh, with benefits in your own area, whereas we don't have that here. So some of you can trade without commission and you just pay a, a small spread. You know, that's an advantage in a lot of ways, too, that we don't have here, which is also a factor for Robins. You're going to be paying a bigger margin, which means you have to be more selective in your trades. You can't overtrade. You can't be real, real frequent. And be silly and sloppy. You have to manage everything. That's trading. That's what a point of the competition is. Now, if you want to have a gambling competition, who can make the biggest money in an account and just go reckless and ham? I, I'm not. I'm not getting in something like that. That's stupid. That that that's to me. You know, even if I won something like that, I'm not going to champion that. <laughs> that's ridiculous. It's just it's equivalent to somebody winning the lottery. I mean, what skill was that? Fuck that. That's nothing to me. But if we're going to talk about who's the better trader, I'm all for it. Let's go. And we're going to do it in the industry standard. So anyway, I've tickled your ears long enough. I probably bored some of you and probably offended some of you also, but it is what it is. I've said my piece. And I think that is going to be it. I'm real close to my timeline. I was given to one o'clock. I'm just about there. So. Hope you found something insightful in all this. Hopefully it was useful to you. If not, I apologize for wasting your time. 
<laughs> I can't guarantee I won't do it again if you listen to another one. But until next time, be safe.